Welcome to r slash am I the jerk, where OP's girlfriend breaks up with them after she sees him crying. My girlfriend broke up with me because she saw me cry. So I, 19 male, and my girlfriend, Stacy, who's 26, we go to the same college. She worked a couple of years before getting her degree and we are in similar majors. She grew up in the deep south and moved here with her mom and sisters when she was 16. She was fairly moderate in her beliefs though, so there was no issue until recently. About three weeks ago, I was taking the metal stairs down from my apartment with my girlfriend and some friends, and I slipped because they were slick. I fell down and broke my leg. I had never had a major medical issue before, and it was the worst pain I had ever experienced. As I was screaming and crying in pain, my friend called 911 and I was taken to the hospital. I fractured my bone when I fell, and I was in the hospital for two days. Stacy left the first night and didn't come back. When I was released, I asked her to live with me for a few days to help me out. She reluctantly agreed, and she seemed distant through the first week. The next Sunday, Stacy sat me down and said she wanted to break up with me. I was devastated and asked her why. She said that she couldn't get the image of me crying on the stairs out of her head, and she didn't see me as a real man anymore. For context, I'm 6'2", I go to the gym, and I play lacrosse for my local adult team. Again, I was devastated and I begged her to stay. She said this is exactly why she was leaving, and she thought I was stronger than this. I was destroyed, and I didn't do anything for a week while I recovered from my leg in the breakup. Doctor said rest for two weeks. By the end of the week, I got texts from my friends saying how sorry they were that me and Stacy didn't work out and that they hoped I had made the right choice. I was confused, and my friends told me that Stacy had said that we both decided to break up because we wanted different things. I corrected them and told them exactly why she broke up with me. Apparently, that news spread through our friend group and everyone is upset with her. She texted me to say that I'm a jerk and that I ruined her life and why couldn't I just go along with it? Some of her friends also called me a jerk and now I don't know who's in the right. So, am I the jerk? Not the jerk. She broke up with you because she didn't like the way you reacted to a medical issue. It's pretty ignorant of her to judge you for something like that. Everyone has a different threshold for pain, and if she was a good partner, she would have supported you instead of making you feel bad. And the whole men don't cry BS is just that, total BS. You deserve to be with someone who supports you, not someone who tears you down. She wanted to keep her reason a secret because she knew that she's a jerk for breaking up with you over that. You don't have to protect her feelings since she clearly didn't give two flying hoots about your feelings. I hope you have a quick recovery, OP. Not the jerk. Bud, there's a reason she could only get a 19-year-old. No man would deal with her BS. She knows she was being unreasonable and that's why she wanted you to lie. Everything that's happening to her is on her and not you. She is an absolutely horrible person and you shouldn't talk to her ever again. Not the jerk. She treated you poorly, then lied about it, then got mad at you for being honest. You're the jerk. Hmm, let's see here. Cries like a baby when you fell down the stairs. Check. Cried and begged her to stay with you when she dumped you. Check. Bro, high value dudes don't cry when a chick breaks up. You tell her, okay, cool, and go on to the next one. They don't want you to be desperate for them. They want you to have options and choose them. Guess you don't know how life works yet because you're 19. And bro, don't believe these comments about how it's okay to be a crybaby in front of your girl. These people on Reddit have no idea what they're talking about. And in real life, the moment you cry like a little baby in front of your girlfriend, she will lose all respect for you. But go ahead and listen to these Reddit idiots instead of me, the dude who makes 80k a year coaching men on how to be successful with women. 80k a year? Reddit boy, I think we picked the wrong niche. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his girlfriend or well, ex-girlfriend? Please let us know. If Reddit boy cried in front of me, I'd be like, it's okay, little guy, and pat him on the head. I hate you, Karen. My husband's new female friend sent a text that has me worried. Am I just being silly? So, I'll start by saying I'm generally quite a secure person and I never felt like I had any issues around this until I read a message sent to my husband yesterday and I'm kind of spiraling now. The backstory. My husband does downhill biking. He's done this ever since he was very young and he knows his stuff and he's out there every day. He generally rides with the same group of guys but they mostly stick to weekends. My husband goes out every day of the week, luckily, because his job allows him to. If he's out on his own, generally weekdays, and the dogs are free, he'll take the dogs. They love it. 
So around six months ago, he was out in the morning with the dogs and ended up coming home earlier than usual. While he was out, he found this girl who fell off and had badly hurt her arm and wrist. As you can imagine, he's done the same numerous times. He knew exactly what to do and where to go to get seen quicker. He got her to the car park, packed the dogs and bikes up, and took her to the GP who referred her to the hospital, and he came home, all good. Around a week after this, one of the guys he rides with sent him a screenshot of a post in a Facebook group that was made for people specifically who build and maintain bike trails. It went something like this. I'm looking for someone called, insert my husband's name, who helped me last week when I fell and got me to the hospital. He drove my husband's truck and had three dogs, then listed our dog's names. She had posted in a few groups before being linked to the group for the trail builders who my husband goes out there with. My husband isn't on social media, so he said he could send her his number. She texted him to double check that she had the right person. He said it was and that he was glad she was feeling better and he was happy to help. She offered him money or to take him out for lunch, which he declined and just said again that he was happy to help. They text back and forth every now and then, her initiating and it's mostly, hey, how are you, hope you're well, etc. Until she starts getting better and can ride again, it turns to, hey, we should hit the trail sometimes. Now, without tooting his horn for him, he's very good. Used to ride competitively when he was younger. Same with much of the guys he rides with. Most people at the park know who they are and generally if they hear them coming, they will just get to one side and watch them pass. He tries to decline her offer in a way not to offend her, but there's no way she can keep up with them. There's a section that's just big jumps to practice on. He says maybe next time he's on those, he'll give her a shout and they can meet up there. Eventually that happens and he gives her a few tips, which then turns into her texting him more often about biking, asking for him to tutor her and just general stuff. This goes on for the next couple of months and there seems to be a friendship starting. I've never once had any concerns about this and was quite happy for him to continue and they do. So yesterday, Monday, he went out with the dogs and he bumped into her. He said they spoke for a while and they went on a ride with the dogs to wind down before he came home. She started texting him when he got home and I can see these messages coming through the iPad as I was using it. To be clear, he's not hiding the texts. He openly leaves his phone lying about, no passcode, lets our daughter play on it, happy for me to use it, doesn't get weird or secretive about it in the slightest. He knows the iPad and laptop are linked to his phone and it can all be seen by anyone using them. He's never gave me cause for concern. It's her intentions I'm not too sure on at this point. So anyway, the dogs. We have three hunting dogs that we use in the fields regularly, and while they can look like they're running riot down these trails, they're extremely well trained and tuned into whatever my husband is doing, which becomes more apparent when he's not on the trails, and they're following, watching his every move. These texts started on about the dogs for a bit when she sent a text which ended in the following, like a slave and their master with a smirk emoji. Admittedly, I don't care for emojis and the texting garbage people use nowadays. I don't even know what this smirk emoji means, frankly, but something about this made me feel icky and I feel like there's an undertone going on here. He replied, but seemed to ignore that last comment. However, this caused me to think and look back on her communication, and I feel like I've always noticed a few red flags. One, she always initiates. Two, if she doesn't get a reply, she seems to keep sending messages until he replies. Three, not once has she ever referenced or acknowledged the fact that he's married or has a family, even when he mentioned that he's been away for my birthday or that he's going to our daughter's dancing show. She'll change the subject as if she's pretending that we don't exist or to close down any mention of us. 4. She often makes excuses for them to meet up one-on-one. -on -one. I'm sure there's more, but I don't want to scour through every message and feed into this more than I already have in case it's nothing. But am I crazy for thinking there may be something going on with her? I don't want to bring it up in case it is nothing and I look like I'm being paranoid. It just isn't sitting right. I'm also pregnant and the hormones are doing their thing. Should I say something or leave it and monitor this more closely for a bit? Or is this the effect of a 30-something pregnant mom whose husband seems to be aging like fine wine and any female he meets doing what he loves being in amazing shape due to the hobby? I'm kind of like your husband. I do a lot of helping people in a different vein though and there are a lot of rather lonely and awkward people out there who just keep messaging once they have my contact info, men and women. I think you've handled this with grace but I think it's totally reasonable for you to have a conversation with your husband and just say, dude, she's pretty pushy and you're not doing anything wrong, but I'd appreciate it if you shut her down and just tell her that you're not in a position to be a coach 
and your ride time is focused so you can't help her. She sounds a little starstruck and needy, but he's not doing anything wrong here, so I wouldn't make it a big deal. OP, thank you. I just don't want to be the pregnant wife who's demanding he blocks women because I'm making things up in my head. He ran into her while he was out walking the dogs? Was this a planned meeting? Does she live near you? That's stalker behavior and he needs to cut her off now. OP, no, the bike park. He was up with the dogs when she spotted them and called one over. Honestly, I have no idea where she lives. I know very little about her other than she's younger than me. It sounds like your husband is uninterested in her and she's pushing boundaries. Tell your husband you feel uncomfortable. He may welcome a chance to strategize how to push her away more clearly. It would probably help if he told her that he was busy with his wife and kids and not interested in connecting, although he's sure she'll find a group to bike with. He could block her if he feels he needs to. Update. It escalated quickly. For those asking why my husband hadn't been more abrupt with her, in a nutshell, he always tries to keep the peace. I downplayed how well-known he is in our town. He comes from a well-known family in our area and was a downhill rider in the UCI and features in various YouTube channels. People come here specifically for the bike trails and typically wherever he goes, there's usually a handful of people who recognize him and want to say hello. It's not a huge town, everyone knows everyone kind of place, and like anyone, he would never want people to come away with any interaction with him with a sour taste in their mouth. After our daughter was in bed, I spoke with my husband and told him my thoughts, and he agreed that she was being inappropriate and that he in no way had done or said anything that would indicate he was alright with it. He hoped by ignoring it, she would get the hint and leave him be. He didn't want to make things awkward or embarrass anyone and admitted he probably should have said something. So after reading everyone's comments, there were loads of amazing ways people suggested shutting her down, which in hindsight would have been an amazing way to stop her in her tracks. However, he didn't want to ruffle feathers, so he went with me. We're starting to get ready for the baby and we have lots to do. Prepare and simply don't have the time or energy to be spent on the bikes or meetups and he will be unavailable to her for the foreseeable suggestions. He typed it up, handed it to me for my approval and I hit send. Minutes later, his phone pings. I'm in the kitchen, he's in the living room and I see his eyebrows raise and he just looks at me. I go over and he just hands me the phone. The audacity on this girl astounds me. She replied, Okay, do you think we could meet up quickly tomorrow? My heart sank, and I knew exactly what that meant. I burst into tears. In my head, this was the start of my world crumbling. My husband tried calming me down and asked me what I'd like him to do. Block her then and there, or ask what she wants to see him for. I wish I just told him to block her, but for some reason I wanted to know more. He replied asking what meeting up would achieve. She just says there's stuff she would like to talk to him about face to face. I felt like I was literally being punched in the chest and being winded at this point. He eventually gets the point across that he's not going to meet with her and drags it out of her. She tells him that at some point, feelings started that turned into fantasies, that I didn't need to know about it and she would be happy to keep it that way. I felt like I was still keeping a level head on it until this point where I lashed out. I got very, very angry, started crying uncontrollably. My body was vibrating with anger. I've barely slept, woke up crying, felt horrible all day today. I've already got in touch with our friends who run these Facebook groups she joined and I asked them to remove her and make sure she doesn't join again. My husband replied last night and told me it's sorted and I don't have to worry about her. I didn't see the text he sent but it's there on the iPad but I can't bring myself to even open the iMessage app after seeing what I saw. It's not fair that someone thinks they can just do something like that regardless of how it's going to impact an entire family. Currently, I don't want him leaving the house I don't want him to ever go back to the trails. I don't want the dogs even going up there. The fact she's even been around my dogs really upsets me. So there we are. I still feel like my life's slipping away from me. Like someone's trying to steal it. My confidence is shattered. My eyes sting. My head hurts from crying. I don't feel like eating. I don't think I've ever felt as low as I do now. Husband's trying his best to comfort me, but it will take a while, I guess. He feels very guilty, despite me telling him he's done nothing wrong. I can't believe how quickly my life just changed with a stupid text. So, thanks to everyone telling me to believe my gut and everyone else who took the time to comment. Edit. I just want to add, I'm not controlling my husband. He had to take them out today. The bike park is almost in our back garden. I'm describing how I feel now. You'll be alright. And honestly, take comfort that this is probably a lot of pregnancy hormones and your husband absolutely loves you. He handled it so well. He's been so transparent and upfront and kind. 
She tried to crash the party and failed miserably. He's all yours and he wants it to stay that way. I hope you feel better and can do some rationalizing in the meantime. Your life didn't change. You're fine. If nothing else, life got better because you now know that your husband would rather be loyal to you than carry on a secret affair with some side piece. Women pursue married men. Men pursue married women. It happens. But your spouse is rock solid. So make sure your actions match your words pertaining to how he did nothing wrong. Good luck with the baby. Am I the jerk for disowning my wife's daughter after she chose her mom's affair partner over me? I met my soon-to-be ex-wife during uni 12 years ago. She already had a kid when she was 19, but the dad left as soon as she started uni. We were dating for three months before I met her daughter, Lisa. I remember seeing her family for the first time. I was nervous meeting her parents, but when I saw little Lisa beside her mom, I was confused. I asked if that was her little sister or a cousin of hers, and her answer shocked me. When she told me that that's her daughter, I thought I misheard her or something. At first, I wanted to dump her for hiding something so crucial from me, but she kept on begging for me to stay, and eventually I relented, and soon enough, I started to love her daughter too and wanted to be her father figure. Our bond grew stronger over the years, and in early 2019, before lockdown, we got married. In late 2021, I adopted Lisa, and in early 2022, my wife gave birth to our son, Mark. After my son was born, my wife made the choice to stay at home for the time being, and I was completely fine with that. Everything was going perfectly until a few months ago. I started noticing my wife increasingly spending time with her friends. At the time, I didn't say anything since, in my mind, being at home all day was probably getting to her, and I didn't want to seem controlling. The thing that made me suspicious was her constant texting and going out of the room for calls. She never did that for anyone besides this one friend of hers. I asked her about it, but she gave me some vague answer about gossip. The moment that took it too far, though, was when I came home last week and saw her outside talking on the phone. This wasn't out of the ordinary. I remember seeing my son on the floor and he was crying. I was upset with my wife for just leaving him alone in the house, but when I went to pick him up, I realized he needed to have a diaper change. I was so furious. It seemed like it hadn't been changed since that morning. I quickly changed him and I rushed outside with him in my arms. I was beyond upset. I snatched her phone from her hand and bolted back inside. I locked her outside to have a tuck with this friend of hers alone. I had my suspicions about who it really was, and when I heard a male voice calling out her name and asking who was there, I immediately knew what was going on. He ended the call as soon as he heard my voice. I then proceeded to lock the front door to make sure my wife wouldn't enter the house at all and proceeded to screenshot as much of their chat as I could and then sent them to myself before deleting them on her phone. About five minutes later, she was still banging on the door leading to the backyard. I reluctantly opened it and she got me good. As soon as she realized what she just did, she apologized profusely, started crying and trying to hug me. I pushed her away and told her to meet me at the dining table. I told my daughter to quickly take care of the baby so me and her mom could have a quick chat. I just kept it simple. I told her this was her only chance to even have a sliver of a chance of getting me back. If she messed up this talk, it was over on the spot. No lies, nothing. She kept on trying to apologize and to say it wasn't that serious. I reminded her that she not only did me over, she could have also easily done more serious harm to our son by leaving him alone in the house like that. I then simply asked, who, for how long, did they hook up? She replied with her ex-boss, Daniel, six months, and she didn't answer the last one, so I kept on reminding her that this was her last chance. She then just simply nodded. She started crying and begging me for forgiveness. She said she would block him then and there, would never contact him again. I could hook up with anyone I want from now on, yada yada. I guess Lisa heard the commotion and came downstairs. I told her to go back upstairs, but she just walked to my wife and asked her if I knew about Daniel. Up to this point I was calm, but upon hearing this, I swear, even I started tearing up. I asked Lisa if she knew all along and she said yes. At this point, I'm full on crying and I asked her why she didn't tell me. She responded with, because unlike you, Daniel buys me the things I want without having to beg. I then asked her how she could possibly do this to her dad. She responded with, you're not my real dad. My wife screamed at her upon hearing what she said. At that point, I couldn't bear any of this anymore. I just grabbed my son and got in the car. Me and my son are currently staying at my parents' house. I've been drinking a lot. Thanks to my mother, my son is being taken care of right now. I'm beyond hurt. I've canceled my ex-daughter's private school tuitions, 
all her extracurricular activities and I've contacted a divorce lawyer. He's going to serve my wife this Friday. My wife and Lisa have been blowing up my phone nonstop with apologies. I simply responded with, get a lawyer and tell that ungrateful thing of yours to start calling Daniel her dad. I'm disowning her. And then I blocked my wife. I didn't respond to Lisa. I just simply blocked her. I guess my wife told our friends what her and Lisa did and now they've been texting me nonstop. They understand how I'm feeling but believe I'm going too far by divorcing my wife without hearing her out. They also keep telling me that disowning Lisa is definitely going too far and she's just a kid and didn't understand what she was doing. I just can't get over the things she told me. I've worked my butt off to give my wife and daughter luxuries. I could have only dreamed of having these as a kid and this is how I get paid back? Lisa, who's 13, is old enough to understand that hiding her mom's affair is bad and definitely purposely use those words to hurt me. But a part of me believes that there's still hope. A few family counseling sessions later, we could go back to living the life I once considered a fairy tale. I'm beyond destroyed by this whole situation, but part of me just believes that there's still hope. Am I really going too far? Am I the jerk for disowning my daughter and divorcing my wife? You have done no fault. Your wife is the one at fault here, and a divorce is reasonable. Your daughter seems to act a bit odd to me. I feel like your wife might have trash-talked you to her behind your back. The hard thing is that she's in her teenage years, which will build resentment towards the parents. And if she can't be taught what is right and wrong, you probably won't hear from her until she realizes it during her 20s. But you don't have to sway anymore unless you want to push for custody. All you can do is stay the kid's father and say you're there to talk whenever she wants, and hopefully she will realize it and gravitate towards you. Not the jerk. I 100% get the hurt and feeling of betrayal. Your stepdaughter might only be 13, but was mature enough to know how to really hurt your feelings. I would stick with a divorce. Cheating is a deal breaker for me. You may be able to salvage the relationship with your daughter, but it's going to take real remorse on her part, or you'll always wonder if she's only apologized to get back in your financial good books. Am I the jerk if I sell my youngest daughter's car to help cover my oldest tuition? I'm 55, male. My daughters are 21 and 17. My oldest is finishing up her junior year of college at a very good school. We are all very proud of her. She has a full-ride academic scholarship that is dependent on her GPA. Well, she says, based on her current grades, after the semester, her GPA will dip below the cutoff. And after extensive back and forth on the phone with the school, they say it's contractual and we will be obligated to pay next year's tuition. If she gets her GPA back above the threshold next semester, we can apparently readdress the situation to determine if her scholarship can be reinstated for the final semester of school. When I tell you we bent over backwards trying to find a solution before we came to the one we did, we've done the math and she can't get her grades up with how much of the semester is left. She also can't take enough credits during the summer based on how the summer classes are structured to raise her GPA high enough even if she got A's and the school refuses to make any exceptions. Of course, we were upset with her for allowing this to happen and we had a long talk with her and she's upset with herself too. But she's a very smart kid who really struggled with her mental health from sophomore year into junior year and it affected her grades. Under no circumstances did we want her to leave college with only one year left. That just truly would not be fair to her after how hard she's worked. For my youngest 17th birthday back in December, we got her a brand new Toyota RAV4. This was somewhat a gift for the fact that she has also been working very hard in high school and getting great grades. She's finishing up her junior year as well and has begun the application process for college. The car was a big deal and she was very happy to have it and has been driving it non-stop. Well, this week, her mom and I sat her down and told her that we're very sorry, but if we can't find another solution, we have to sell her car to help cover oldest tuition. Mind you, the cost of this car will cover probably one-third of the tuition for one full year after FAFSA, probably less with the value depreciation. She became extremely upset and told us it was unfair we were rewarding our oldest for failing and punishing her for succeeding. And whose car would we sell if the same happened to her? But we never wanted her to feel punished or for our oldest to feel rewarded. It's just the reality of what we need to do right now. If the same happened to her, we would do everything in our power to help. So, please tell me if I would be the jerk for selling the car. You would be the jerk. You can't rob Peter to pay Paul. If you sell that car, the youngest will resent you forever. Also, how do you have the money to buy a 17-year-old a brand new car and not have enough for tuition? What were you going to do for her education fund? My sisters had my mom and dad help with college. My mom passed when I was a high school senior. I worked 40 hours a week and went to school full-time and took out student loans. 
One time I was short $3,000 and needed his help. He gave it, but then used it against me in as many times as he could. Never did that to my sisters. It's one of the many reasons I'm no contact with my dad. My mom used my college fund to send my sister to a fancy boarding school for high school. I went to public school for high school and had nothing for college. That's one of the many reasons I'm no contact with my mom. I've got a list a mile long. You're the jerk. Your eldest can take out education loans for her last year, and you can take out parental loans if needed. This is what most students do. She can also seek a part-time job. There's no reason or justification for taking away the car you gifted your younger kid. Well, what do you think? Would OP be the jerk or not? Please let us know. Gotta love when someone buys their teenager a brand new car then runs into financial problems. Like, bruh, they're 17. They should be driving a green Saturn with a trash bag over one of the windows. Karen demands I buy toys for her kid, too. My husband, Dean, who's 29, and I, who am 26, have a wonderful daughter, Lisa, who's four. I'm a musician by trade, so my work has pretty much stopped and my husband has been working a lot the past few months. I'm basically at home all the time with Lisa and she's missing her dad a lot as she's his double and 100% a daddy's girl. Anyway, I met up with my sister, Rose, who's 32 recently, and we ended up visiting a toy store. I saw this male doll, which looked a lot like Dean, and I decided to buy it for Lisa so that she'd always have a reminder of her daddy. Rose was miffed by this and demanded I buy my niece, Flora, also for a doll. For years, Rose has been trying to basically force me to treat her daughter the same or better than my own. Here are some examples of her behavior. There's only five months difference between the girls and I've had to deal with Rose being weird about that fact for years and during my pregnancy. Lisa is my second daughter as I had a stillborn daughter in late 2014 at 20 and it broke me. Rose witnessed this and when she announced her pregnancy, she was horrible and said that she was expecting the first grandchild saying my first daughter didn't count while our parents and family said it was the second grandchild. Then, when I got pregnant again, Rose was weird about it, saying I shouldn't have gotten pregnant so quickly and accused me of stealing her thunder of the new grandchild. There's been some other occasions where she just expects our kids to share everything and make everything about Flora for being the first grandchild, and I've just had to put up with it. Anyway, Rose kept insisting, and I just snapped and said, No, I am sick of you pushing your kid onto me and basically making my own take a back seat. I'm buying my kid a doll, literally, to make her happy because she's missing her daddy. Buy your own kid a toy. I ended up buying the toy and walking off. She went tattling to our parents, adding dramatic flair to the story, calling me a massive jerk for refusing to buy my niece a toy. My dad is on my side, saying I've had to put up with her glorifying her kid for years whilst ignoring mine, whilst my mom thinks I should give in to her. My husband says he's sick of Rose, and she even brought up my other daughter again, saying she'd be ashamed of her mommy. That reduced me to tears, and I told her she's dead to me, but my mom insists I apologize to Rose. Edit. The girls weren't with us. What would you do if you had a sister like Rose? Would you give in to her? Would you try to work things out? Please let us know. Update. Entitled parents who disowned us for not having kids struck again. I did not expect to be back so soon, but here we are. About a month ago, my fiancé and I posted about how both of our parents decided to threaten us to be taken off their will if we did not give them grandchildren, which we won't be. Anyhow, they struck again and my fiancé is really fuming with rage now and wants to share the situation with you all. There are some points that will need clarification and I'll try to make them along the way. First, as we mentioned in our last post, due to the absurdity of the situation our parents were imposing on us, we felt that we do not want them on our wedding. Thus, we rescinded their invitation as a whole. My brother is my best man, and he supports us wholeheartedly. Now, we get to the point of the post. After we left my parents' home that day, we had absolutely zero contact with them. They made their decision, and we made ours. We thought that was going to be it. Now, one thing that needs to be clarified, our wedding was planned to be happening in October 17th. However, due to everything going on right now, these large gatherings of people are completely prohibited, on my region at least. But thankfully, the venue we had acquired is run by the most lovely administrators. As soon as everything started, they contacted us and gave us every assistance needed with rescheduling. Thus, we rescheduled our wedding to 2021 in the same month, as the situation is still uncertain. 
That can change, but shouldn't for the time being. We aren't really bothered by it as we understand the situation is very dire and we don't mind waiting for a time where everyone will be safe, possibly. This morning while I was studying for some exams I'll be having at school, my fiance got a call from the venue administrator asking why did we want to cancel our wedding. Obviously, this was very strange and confusing to us. My fiance let them know that we had no desire to cancel our wedding and further asked what that was about. Apparently, my fiance's parents called the venue on our behalf, telling them that we no longer wanted to rent the place as we would no longer be getting married. Now, let me explain why the venue was leaning on accepting this situation. In my country, our IDs carry not only our ID and social security equivalent number, but also the name of the parents, and to rent a venue, you need to provide your ID for them as a bureaucracy requirement. I don't know if that's how it works everywhere, so I wanted to make it clear. Apparently, they wanted to take advantage of the fact and tried to dupe the venue to cancel our wedding. Luckily, the administrator is quite smart and saw that on our sheet, needed for rental, there are only two names slash numbers for contact if we can be reached. One is my brother and the other is my fiance's best friend. At the time we booked the place, we were already in a strained relationship with our parents, so neither of us put them as a contact. Thankfully, the administrator actually paid attention to that and took the care and time to reach out to us. Otherwise, we might not only have lost our special date, but also all our deposit and dream venue. I'll be honest in saying that I never expected that kind of behavior from anyone in our families, but alas, it seems I was wrong. Anyway, now my fiance is letting out fumes and I'm trying to calm her down. We already sent a contact to her parents and mine as we are sure they are in this together for them to never try to meddle in our lives again. My brother is as angry as we are and he just told me that he was heading to their house to tear them a new one. I don't even know how to feel right now. I'm crestfallen if anything. I never expected or wanted things to be this way, but neither of us will go back on our decision of not having kids. Truth be told, I already have the papers for sterilization ready. I just hope that one day they do see that their entitlement just lost them their son and daughter all because of grandkids that will never exist. Cheers. Edit. Thank you for all the nice replies. We really appreciate it. We just spent the whole afternoon calling all our services, making sure to create methods so this never happens again. It's taken care of and thank you all for the advice. I don't really know what my brother told them as he went from there to his work. I did get a text from them complaining that we released our rabid dog on them, which is amusing to be honest, as my brother is a very calm person. We won't contact them again. Once more, thank you for all the kind words. Second edit. We did decide on passwords with all of our contracts and shouldn't have any further problems. But on that note, for those who asked, our parents didn't give us a dime to pay for our wedding. We worked ourselves and paid for every little thing. They have absolutely no right over it. I did mention this on the previous post. We don't want their money, neither do we need it. We're just sharing and venting our frustration. Anyway, thank you all for the lovely replies and awards. Cheers. What would you do if your parents tried to cancel your wedding? Please let us know. I had canceled them. Am I the jerk for purposefully getting pregnant while I have a roommate? So, there's me, 27 female, my boyfriend, 30 male, and my friend, 23 female. Let's call her Becca. Well, my boyfriend and I had been discussing the possibility of starting a family for about six months before the you know what started. When our state went into lockdown, Becca went from full-time employment to part-time and could no longer afford her apartment on her own. So she asked if she could move in with us for a while until she could figure out what to do about her money situation. My boyfriend and I talked it over and both agreed that we wanted to help her out because she's a good friend and we didn't want to see her go into unnecessary debt or worse, have an eviction on her record if the worst case scenario happened. I warned her about the fact that my boyfriend and I were talking about having a baby though and that our decision wouldn't be hindered by our new living arrangement. She has a room to herself. We have a two-bedroom apartment. She wasn't thrilled about this but agreed because it was her best option. Well, we finally decided in July that we're both officially ready to have a baby and somehow we got lucky because I just found out last week that I'm pregnant. I'm so excited and I couldn't wait to talk to Becca about it. I know it's early to tell people but she is currently our roommate and it'll be a change for her too. And oh man, was that a mistake. She was upset when I told her. She basically said that she's still really stressed and struggling because of her job situation and now is working two jobs 
which means that she gets very little time to sleep or relax, and she doesn't want to live with a baby on top of everything else. I told her I'm very sorry that she's stressed, and I know her situation sucks, but I warned her about this from day one. I understand that I could have told her when we started trying, but a lot of people are grossed out by that now, and it's not like she didn't know about our plans. Plus, it's my apartment and my life. I don't feel like I should have to put off my own life because I'm helping out a friend. So, am I the jerk for purposefully getting pregnant while I have a roommate? Well, what do you think? Should OP have changed her plans now that Becca lives with her or not? Please let us know. I think she needs to kick Becca out, to be honest. Don't think I'm worth the money? Kiss your income goodbye. So I was living in a town where there was an old hotel that was in the process of being converted to apartments, ended up moving in, and at some point started to help the owner, let's call him Steve, out with a lot of stuff. Started with little odd jobs here and there, helping tear out a wall or take debris out. No big deal really, made a few extra bucks. Being a geek, it didn't take long to start ending up helping handle some other stuff. They had internet access available, but it was using HPNA, so basically in-home DSL, over lines in a 50-year-old building. They slowly were adding more people here and there, so adding more capacity ended up being my job as well as handling the installs and troubleshooting. Building had its own cable system as well, and it had issues with some stuff overheating. Came up with a design that would simplify the build-out somewhat and remove the issue of overheating boxes as well as adding more room for channels to be added and creating a type of scrolling TV guide channel using Titan and an auto-scroll plugin in the browser, then piping it onto a channel and adding some music. Before long, I was handling most of the maintenance for all of the apartments, internet, cable, lockouts, and whatever else might be needed. Then Steve's stepdaughter moved in and things started to happen that were fishy. My information being removed as the lockout number among other things. So I gracefully moved on and got out of the way as I didn't want to be in the middle of family. I also had no hard feelings for Steve over what the daughter or her husband was doing. I still got calls with questions and would answer them here and there. About six months after moving out, I got a call that Steve needed help as the boiler system was acting up and basically the building did not have heat. I went down and helped get things tore apart since the daughter's husband couldn't be bothered. He moved out of a house because he didn't want to take care of things, even though the wife did most of it. Ended up, the fins on the boiler had clogged up with suit during startups over a few years. We cleaned it all out and got it up and running. Owner had another project he wanted some help with, so rather than turn down some extra cash, I figured why not? We ran a small water line from the top of multiple plumbing shafts to the basements so that a set of valves could be put into place so the recirculation pump would be able to evenly get water through the lines and everyone would have instant hot water. Ended up moving back to the area a couple months later as I started helping Steve with an even larger building nearby. The old hotel, converted to apartments, was 10 stories tall, so not small, but didn't need a lot done most of the time. The new place was not as tall, but was larger and more spread out. One section had three floors, and the whole thing set on something nearly the size of a city block. I think total square footage was around 50k inside. I was taking care of the apartment maintenance needs, and a few other things again as well as staying in the building with my wife, who was acting as a lookout in the evenings. During the day, I would help out with whatever was going on. We literally reworked a lot of structural steel, reclad one section of the building with corrugated steel sheets extended one section of the building and poured concrete floors and retaining walls. I started having issues here and there with getting overheated during the day, heat stroke, and while I was living there, I had not actually moved yet, so ended up taking a week to put most of our things in storage. We were literally living at the building in an RV I had to keep the building secure. When I got back, Steve started complaining that the power for the building was $100 and blamed it on me running an air conditioner. We had been running a 220 welder on average 4 hours a day, 5 days a week, but it had to be that AC unit and basically said there was no way I could keep an eye on things if it was running because I couldn't hear anything. It had been over a month straight with highs over 100 degrees, but with another roof over my RV, it never got direct heat, so I called BS as my 2 bedroom apartment I just vacated only had electric costs around 120 per month and it was all electric with a lot more items using power including my aquarium. A question was then made about what I thought I was worth. I figured $10 per hour. I dealt with a lot including maintenance on all the machinery and his vehicle and never charged for fuel or mileage when I would drive my own vehicle to do things. For as long as I worked for the guy, I always had to bid my jobs outside of maintenance work. 
I was only receiving a flat amount of money each month for the work in the building and my wife received nothing for keeping an eye out, which she did pretty well, since I actually caught someone in the building with her seeing them. Steve stated that no one was worth $10 an hour to him. Other things were being thrown out as my fault too. Basically, Steve was under the gun on a couple of things as when he bought the building, it was actually scheduled to be torn down and another building across the road, which was also scheduled to be torn down, was bought slightly after he purchased his, yet it had already been completely rehabilitated and was opening up space for lease. The other building was smaller, but had quite a bit more to have done to it to get it up to code. The roof was completely gone, and the inside was so full of trash, it took nearly a month to clean it out. Steve kept changing things after something was done, and then turning around and changing them again, wasting more and more time. A lot of other things were going on as well, so I opted to be done and move on again this time with no option of going back. My wife's health had started going downhill anyway, so being blamed for petty crap wasn't worth it and I obviously was not wanted around anymore. Now here's the revenge. I had told him multiple times that there was an issue with his fire alarm panel not charging the batteries. The local fire department had been on him once before and forced more smoke detectors to be installed as a retrofit and a few other things. The smoke detectors were installed, but the battery charging issue was never fixed properly. Other things in the building had also started to fall into disrepair that I had told him needed to be dealt with. For instance, some very large windows were cracked and a few had pieces broken with tenants in them. It was a two-man job to fix the windows and Steve had too many irons in the fire. He had sunk over 500k into the new building and couldn't afford to have someone else do the work and didn't think it was worthwhile, so he kept putting it off. I went ahead and contacted the city about issues that needed to be addressed as well as dropped some complaints about things. I used multiple email addresses from accounts I set up for exactly that purpose so it would never track back to me and contacted multiple members of the city council as well as the fire chief slash marshal. I never contacted Steve again, but the last time I was there, the apartment building was shut down with signs stating that it could not be occupied. Since the fire alarm panel had been written up on once before due to issues and he had been told that if it became a problem again, a sprinkler system would be required to bring the building up to code with it acting up again, the fire marshal shut it down. The new building is now off the demolition list, but it once again sits empty as there is likely not enough money left to pull from the apartment building to make it complete. You see, being off the list only required it to be warehouse grade which is basic lighting, emergency lighting, mostly airtight, with egress and fire systems. Once that was done, more work would be needed to actually start using the structure for office space and things of that nature. Going from 100 apartments to 23 with a few rent houses that needed work likely took the last little bit of money he had free to do things. The apartment building was truly unsafe, as if the power went out, the fire alarm panel would not function, and with a tall building, a fire on the lower floor would be bad. All he had to do was to fix it so the batteries were charged and would stay that way and pay someone to work on the panel if it was acting up. But then again, no one was worth $10 an hour. Why would he pay someone who was going to make even more than that? I felt bad for most of the people who lived there since they lost their home, but I would have felt worse if they were hurt or worse in a fire. The one thing I wish I had seen was the stepdaughter and her husband's faces while they had to move. They were on the top floor as well as Steve's and his wife face when the building was basically condemned. But I still go back and look at the news article showing it was all shut down and have a little smile. It just doesn't pay to be a jerk when someone has tried to help you out. Am I the jerk for not helping a single mom? So, one of the women in my friend circle, Jane, who's 24, whom I, whom 26, female, don't know well, gave birth a couple of months ago. She doesn't have a job and her parents refused to help her because she cheated on her boyfriend of three years for six months before her pregnancy. She then got pregnant and the side guy broke it off, sending her ex-boyfriend proof of what was going on. When her boyfriend found out, he lost it and decided he didn't want anything to do with the kid. He works as a cashier, so he can't pay much child support. Jane decided to keep the kid and asked her friends to pitch in to help her pay for expenses and rent. After her son's birth, Jane decided that her current studio apartment, which we have been paying for, wasn't good enough for her. She needed a better place because it was too small. All our friends looked at me expectantly as I live alone in a large three-bedroom apartment and am the only one in our group with a stable and well-paying job. I gave in and let her live with me under the condition that she would take care of her son and do some of the chores, washing her own dishes, doing their laundry, etc. 
The last two months have been heck for me. She whines if I ask her to do anything and even called me selfish and mean because I, at first, refused to take care of her kid, who she is being paid to take care of. She forced me to take three leaves because she wanted to go out. This Monday, I woke up to get to work and found her gone with a note on my fridge on how she needed a break and wouldn't be back till late. I called her and texted her, telling her that I couldn't take leave or find a babysitter on such short notice. I decided to work from home and take care of the baby while she celebrated about starting a new chapter of her life. When she came back, I placed her son in her arms and gave her a month's notice, telling her to go find a new setting for her new chapter. She started crying and begged me to reconsider. I told her I was tired of being her bank account and that if she wasn't ready to take care of her own kid, then she shouldn't have had one in the first place. I woke up to angry texts from our friends the next day. Jane has been guilt tripping me since Tuesday. She's been complaining to friends and posting on social media about how some people don't understand single mother struggles. She said she deserved all my money and would sue me for it. I said good luck and told her I would stop paying for her necessities if she kept acting like this. That shut her up for now. I feel like I did the right thing, but I also think that I picked the worst time for this because of everything going on. Am I the jerk? As a kid, I was neglected by my parents and wasn't even close enough to them to talk to them about the weather. I didn't want Jane's son to have a bad parent because I know what it's like, so I tried to help and maybe get Jane to realize that her son is the one person closest to her right now and she should take care of him. About our friend group, they've not listened to me at all and asked me if I really expected a new mother to work. I really don't know what's going on in their heads. They said that as I had the resources to take care of them, it was my duty to. They haven't helped with Jane's bills since she moved in. Her baby's father is minimum wage. She won't reveal to me exactly how much she gets, she just said it wasn't enough to foot her own grocery bill. Pretty sure that isn't true. Well, what do you think? Do you agree with OP or with Jane? Please let us know. Sounds to me like OP needs to find some new friends and kick Jane out. You're physically incapable of leaving the store? I work at a small store on a college campus. We're right across the street from the school's bookstore and are technically a branch of it. Every semester, the bookstore hosts a poster sale outside in a tent. It's completely leased out to a company and all transactions are done through them. I couldn't honestly tell you what we get out of it, but it's not sales. School started this week for us and despite everything going on right now, we're all going ahead with mostly in-person classes. Still, we've had a lot of phone calls instead of in-person sales and I'm always grateful to the people who do them since it benefits both of us. Today, I got a call from someone a bit different. Caller. Hey, I just spoke with your staff about the details of the poster sale, and I was just calling back to see if you could tell me the price of the posters. Me. I'm so sorry, but I don't actually know. It's not actually under our division. We just know the dates and times because of the flyers they asked us to hand out. Caller. Well, could you go check for me? Me. I'm sorry, but they don't have a website, and all the posters are different sizes and prices anyway. I can transfer you to the bookstore, and someone might be able to help you over there. Caller. Well, can't you just go across the street and check for me? It's literally right there. Me, incredibly short-staffed and already having a terrible day. I'm sorry, sir. I can't leave the store. What do you mean? It's literally right across the street. It'll just take a second. Me, completely taken aback that this man, who isn't even a customer, is asking me to literally exit my store to tell him the prices from another retailer. Sir, I'm clocked in over here. I'm sorry. I can't leave the store. You literally can't leave the store? Like you're physically incapable of leaving the store? Me, completely done with the day at 11 a.m. Yes, that's correct. Caller. Wow, great customer service. Thanks. At this point, I said thank you, and he told me to have a nice day. I attempted to return the sentiment, but alas, my new friend hung up on me. And just when he was learning the boundaries of my workplace prison, maybe one day I will escape the physical entrapment of my store. Edit. I'd just like to add that this poster sale is done entirely in person. They don't ship or hold anything or do orders over the phone as they don't have a phone. He would have to go inside the tent no matter what. Would I be the jerk if I make my fiance choose between me or living with a joint family? So for context, I am Indian. A joint family, that is a couple living with the male partner's parents and possibly other relatives, is the norm. Living with your husband's parents after marriage is usually what most women do and it is not at all frowned upon. I met my fiance in college when I was 20. We were friends and started dating. 
When we got serious, around the seven month mark, I made my views on the whole joint family system clear. I absolutely hate it and would never want to live with my husband's parents. Extended family is out of the question. He assured me that he would take up employment in Bangalore, where our university is, and not move back to Panthakot, his hometown, to live with his family. He claimed he too did not like the whole idea. I value my privacy and space a lot. I, in fact, don't even like to live with my own parents. When we turned 23 and graduated, we moved in together and have been living together in Bangalore for four years. He proposed a few weeks ago and I said yes. I need to add that both of us are advocates, attorneys, and each state has a separate bar exam. We are both bar members in Bangalore, not in Panthakot. Yesterday, he asked me how I would be studying for the Punjab bar exam. I was perplexed. He nonchalantly stated that to live with him and his parents and extended relatives, we would move to Punjab. If I wanted to continue working, I would have to take up the bar. I saw red. I had been very clear about this at the very beginning. We had a few similar discussions at the two-year mark and five-year mark. Now, he says, they are very open. You can do what you want. We are not conservative. That is BS. No matter how open, I won't have the same freedom and independence I have now. My finances would be pooled into the joint family fund and there would be restrictions. I have spent five years studying law and four years practicing in court to earn where I am. I can't just leave him. We've been together for seven years and have an otherwise good relationship. I want to give him an ultimatum. It is me or the joint family, to be clear, living with them. I want him to have a relationship with his family and I want to have a relationship with them as well, but not by living together. I'm now being accused of distancing a mother from her son by a few angry calls from his whole clan. Would I be the jerk if I gave him this ultimatum? Edit. Thank you for all your responses. It makes me feel that my views and opinions are valid and I have every right to decide what to do. This really means a lot since the closest people in my life couldn't or rather wouldn't understand where I'm coming from. You all really gave me strength. The Parmesan Cheese Incident This story happened a few years ago when I worked for a supermarket chain that promotes organic food. I was hired to be the buyer for the specialty foods department, but I soon came to realize that they expected me to do the work of someone with a higher title for less pay. Our team was always short-staffed, and the few other workers always had excuses for doing less work, so it all got dumped on me. On this particular day, I was short-staffed and by myself from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. The store assistant manager wandered up and announced, You need my help. You need more Parmesan cheese out. I'll cut it. Now, first of all, while assistant manager was a generally nice guy, he was the sort of inept person that made you wonder how the heck he made his way up to his position. He may have been good at customer service, but he had no skills whatsoever to help out in my department. He had tried helping in the past and had made a mess of things, so I learned my lesson there. The cheese in question is specifically known as Parmigiano Reggiano. A full wheel is about 85 pounds. Anyone who works in the specialty cheese industry knows that you need a special set of tools to cut it, as well as the skills needed. It's not a job for the novice. A new person must be trained, helped, and monitored. Also, a second person comes in handy to help flip an 85-pound wheel of cheese. I came to this job with years of experience, and I made a point to tell them during my interview that I cannot do this one job due to my arthritis. No problem, I was told. Other team members can do it. So I explained to assistant manager that I had another coworker coming in at 2 p.m. who was going to do it because he knew how to do it and was good at it. Assistant manager still wanted to do it. I tried explaining that you need to use special tools to cut it and special training, and I didn't have time to stop and show him how to do it. I'll figure it out, assistant manager said. I tried asking him to do a number of different, easier tasks to help me out instead. No, I can cut the parm, he said. I tried every diplomatic way to politely dissuade him from doing this, but he insisted on doing it. I was overdue for my break anyway, so I told myself to just let this happen. I returned from my break to see what had happened. An entire 85-pound wheel of expensive cheese was absolutely butchered. It was done with maximal waste, and each individual piece was wrapped up for sale in a way that would be unacceptable by the company's standards. I shrugged my shoulders. It wasn't my mess, and I had my own job to do orders to place, and time deadlines to place them. The next day I show up and am immediately attacked by the department team leader. I calmly explained what happened and she still wanted to blame me for it. She asked why I didn't take the time to train assistant manager. I pointed out that I didn't have the time being short-staffed. 
She asked why I didn't take the time to rewrap, clean up, and fix all the cheese. I pointed out how long that would take and that I would get in trouble for working overtime. She insisted that she and I needed to have a meeting with the store manager immediately. So after talking it out and pleading my case in the store manager's office, the store manager graciously gave me permission to nicely and directly tell inexperienced supervisors to go away and not help in the future. My team leader later pulled me aside and apologized to me, but then she gave me a big condescending lecture about how I just wasn't doing a good enough job, and if I didn't get better, I may get demoted or fired. Not long after that, I gave my notice to work a new job at a lovely, privately owned cheese shop where I was much happier and my skills were truly appreciated. Take care of my kids or get out. I moved in with a girl entitled Mom in October of last year. She had four sons. We moved into a new home together due to her being kicked out of her other place. We both needed a home but couldn't afford one alone, so we agreed to become roommates. We worked together and thought it would be a good idea. The agreement was half and half. The place was a really big house, honestly. Two-story, five bedrooms, but super cheap. During November, the weather was still pretty warm, not too cold, at least to me anyways. I worked two jobs during this time, and one was third shift, so I stayed in my room anytime I was home, kept my vent closed so no heat would go in. Leading up to the incident, we kept getting into disagreements about the heat. Entitled Mom would set the heat on 90, and it would be an oven in the house. I hated it, because when I was home, I couldn't breathe. But for the most part, I wasn't there due to work. Her kids would also leave all the lights on, so bills were getting ridiculous, and I had to pay half. Then my boyfriend moved in, so bills got split in three. Now, me and my boyfriend are paying two-thirds of the bills when we're rarely home, and when we are, we're sleeping. But I didn't say anything for a while because I agreed to this. I couldn't find anywhere else to live, so this was life. Then comes the end of December. My main job was cleaning machines in factories, so when everyone else goes on two-week break at the end of December, United States, I work 12-hour days for 16 days straight, including Christmas Eve and 8 hours on Christmas night. Three days before Christmas Eve, Entitled Mom texts me telling me she needs me to babysit her four kids because she has to work. I have babysat a couple times for her and it was awful. I told her I couldn't because I had to work. She told me to call in because if she does, she will lose her job. Fast food. I told her I couldn't because I would lose mine and if I did, I wouldn't be able to pay bills or survive at all. She sent me several messages telling me that she would just leave them home and I could sleep till she gets home. She would be home before I had to leave for work. She has said this before and I didn't get any sleep and couldn't go to work because she didn't get home until hours after I was supposed to be clocked in. I told her no. She knows her kids don't let me sleep and I can't miss any more time due to the last time I had to miss because of babysitting. She got mad and stopped replying. I thought this was the end of it until I got a threatening message from her girlfriend in prison telling me I need to pull my weight and do my part. How dare you do this to entitled mom when she has done everything for you, was a part of the message. She did nothing but agree to be a roommate. We got this house together. I texted entitled mom and told her it was BS. She was saying I wasn't doing anything to help when me and my boyfriend pay two thirds of the expensive bills when we don't use 90% of the bills. She told me that I needed to watch her kids or I could leave. Rent was due a week later and she had blown all her money and child support on these super expensive toys. Went broke the day after Christmas. So I decided instead of paying her rent, I would find something else. So I moved out exactly 29 days later, paid absolutely no bills during that time and refused to help her with laundry or cleaning after her kids anymore. She told everyone that I didn't help her, but the truth is I had spent every day after one job and before my other putting the house together after we moved in. She lost a true friend because she was selfish and entitled. Dine and Dash Karen gets what she deserves. My group of friends have been together for quite some time, at least starting from the end of middle school. The majority of us ended up going to the same college, so good for us. Anyway, one of our friends has been acting unreasonably and starting drama for fun. It's been slowly building up for about a year. Now, gossip and rumors we can deal with because we know each other and we can usually pick the truth from the lies easily. At the point of her rumor spreading, we distanced ourselves from her quite a bit. Her latest antics have been much different. For the sake of this story, her name can be D. In our area, cases have been low, so we've started to go out more with the whole gang. Extra precautions aside, things look to be normal. 
We eat at a semi-formal restaurant, as is our custom. Something about dressing up and treating ourselves is something we try to do as much as we can financially permit. Things seem fine until the bill comes and it's time for each of us to settle up. Dee starts to get shifty and starts tapping at her phone. She stands up quickly and says she needs to go. It's an emergency. She fast walks out of the dining room and out of sight. We try to text and call her, but no answer. We end up all absorbing her part of the bill. A one-time favor for a friend in need, right? The second part of our routine is to go to the host's house, where we drink, watch movies, and have a good time. Kelly was to be the host this time. We're not much for gossip, but Dee's old behavior mixed with her previous antics got us on the topic. All six of us shared some stories, and it looks like every one of us had some personal run-in with our friend. The second time we all go out to dinner, everything seems well. Dee ordered a lot of mixed drinks and seemed thoroughly tipsy. Foolishly, we believed she would pay her tab this time. Before the waiter could even bring up how we wanted the bill split, Dee excused herself to the bathroom and did not return. We all have jobs along with scholarships, so thankfully money isn't our primary worry. However, last time's bill paired with Dee's inflated dinner and alcohol tab would set us collectively back about $300. Reluctantly, we paid. Although we didn't see her, it was assumed that she drove home. We rendezvous to the host's place, very annoyed and in no mood to party. Again, Dee refuses our calls and does not open our messages. We busy ourselves by trying to get in touch with some of Dee's other friends. Through the mishmash of conversation, it was revealed that Dee was receiving a stipend from her father that she was saving to buy herself a new Tesla. Not only did she have a job, but she was getting free money from her dad. There was no reason for her to not pay her bills. I guess she thought this way she could get her Tesla faster. We had collectively been fed up with her crap. Since all of us felt burned, we decided to plan some revenge. We knew she had the cash, she just didn't feel obliged to hold her weight. At this point, we were all working up to how entitled she could be. Our sense of loyalty and nostalgia had blinded us for way too long. Today was the day. We decided to go to a very nice restaurant today, about twice the prices of what we would normally do. Dee looked so excited, bless her. We all ate, drank, and had a great time. Dee had ordered many drinks and was again drunk. We were careful not to wait too long or else Dee would dash, so just as dessert was over and the prospect of after-dinner coffee was being thrown around, we all declared that we had a surprise for Dee. Next month is her birthday, so we thought it would be reasonable enough time to use it as an excuse for her to close her eyes. Dee did as she was told and was instructed not to open her eyes until we said so, because the gift takes a minute to set up. We all got up, quietly filed out of the restaurant and left her there with her eyes closed. Just as we were pulling out of the parking space, we all took one car to save time after our escape. Dee took her own car as usual. We saw Dee running out of the doors searching wildly for us. She caught sight of the car just as we rolled away. Our phones were blowing up like crazy, tons of vile messages following the calls. I got to thinking, the bill must have totaled around $700-ish for everyone. We would never have picked this place normally, although the food was very good. The rest of the gang headed to my apartment. About 30 minutes later, we each received a message saying we owed her $738.17 along with a photo of the bill. She had the audacity to include her part of the bill in that amount as well, and judging by the receipt, she gave no tip. Classy. I replied with this message, guess you'll have to dip into your Tesla fund. Take an Uber home before you lose your scholarship and your friends, boozer. We know you can afford it. To say she went crazy is an understatement. She went coca duds. She tore us a new one on Twitter, blocked us, then unblocked us to rip us some more, then blocked us again. Now Kelly, who has an alternate Snapchat account, is treating us to her near psychotic rants talking about fake jerks who never did anything for her. I guess that's us. Maybe next time she'll learn to pay for herself like an adult. Have you ever had someone expect you to pay for their food? If so, what did you do about it? Please let us know. Entitled mom ends my engagement and gets me banned from the steakhouse. Oh my gosh, so glad I found this sub. Here we go. I can finally air my frustration about the night my engagement was single-handedly corrupted by my entitled mother-in-law. Let's call her Ellen because she always reminded me of Ellen DeGeneres. Okay, 
So my girlfriend and I were really engaged to be engaged. We had both agreed we wanted to get married, but I hadn't done the formal proposal yet because we wanted to meet each other's families first. Neither lived nearby. I always thought the old trope about meeting the in-laws being a big fiasco was a myth, both because I was younger and more naive then and because I'm lucky to have easy parents. My girlfriend met them for a few hours. Once we were alone, just me and them, I told them my intentions and my mom asked, does she have any kids already? And my dad asked, does she have a good solid job? And they both asked, you really love her? And that was that. I had their full support for the marriage. I thought meeting her parents would be the same. Some grilling was to be expected, but as long as I was honest and respectful, it would all be fine. Relevant fact, they had my girlfriend when they were teenagers, by surprise, so now had a do-over daughter, their words not mine, who was only six. My girlfriend and I made the trip up to their city and I met them for the first time over a dinner at a steakhouse. It was pretty upscale and we had scheduled the dinner for 8pm, so I was surprised to see they had brought the kid along with them. I met everyone at once and the initial awkwardness settled once we had sat down. We were making great small talk when the six-year-old said she was thirsty. No big deal, right? Well, all of a sudden, Ellen starts screaming, Water! 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 A waiter came rushing over to see what the commotion was, and without even making eye contact with the poor guy, Ellen went, We've been here forever, and no one's even gotten us any water. My daughter's been asking. We had been sitting for about 15 or 20 minutes without service, but they were visibly behind, and there were no circumstances that would have warranted that shouting. I should have realized from how unfazed everyone else at the table was that I should be bracing myself for a long night, but I couldn't imagine what was to come at that point. The waiter rushed over with water and apologized for the delay, explaining a few very large parties had arrived all at once. The guy seemed sincere and quite affable, so I thought the water would just be an anomaly in an otherwise pleasant night. Then Ellen kicked into full gear. We'll need a kid's menu, she informed the waiter. He said that they didn't have a kid's menu, but that the chef could simplify most dishes. What do you mean you don't have a kid's menu? Ellen replied in total disbelief, as though he had said they didn't have a fire exit. He explained that they didn't get too many kids there, and that there were enough plain foods on the menu that no separate menu had ever been necessary. Ellen sighed dramatically and waved him away. Literally, without saying a word, waved him off from the table. I tried to give him an apologetic glance, but understandably, he didn't look back our way. I was so glad the poor guy left and didn't have to be subjected to her anymore. Meanwhile, she turned her attention on me, and I almost wish he had come back. At least he was getting paid to be there. She was like, so, you're a screenwriter? And I explained, well, yes and no. I want to be, but it's hard to get a job in that field that you can support yourself on, so I'm working at a non-profit right now. There's a screenwriting component to the job though, so I'm really happy there. Ellen turned to her six-year-old and went, Hear that, hun? You want to be sure to snag a man who works for profit. Learn from this. It's not too late for you. I couldn't tell if she was trying to be funny or not, so I just let it pass, looking over to my girlfriend to see if she was even considering speaking up on my behalf. Nope. The waiter came back, visibly nervous. That hurt because he was so relaxed and personable at the start of the meal. He asked if we had liked to hear the specials before we ordered, and Ellen said sure. Here's how that went. Waiter. First, we have a lightly seared strip steak, Ellen. Next. Waiter. Oh, uh, okay. Then we have a broiled leg of grass-fed, next. Oh, uh, okay. We, we have a pasta primavera mixed with, next. And on and on, until he had gone through all seven or ten specials, even though she ultimately ordered off the menu, a plain ribeye. Well done. She tried to order her daughter the same, but the kid said she just wanted plain mashed potatoes, so Ellen let her get mashed potatoes alone for dinner. Then she sent the waiter away. The rest of us hadn't even ordered yet, and everyone else just sat there like it was entirely normal. I waited for someone to say something, thinking it was more her older daughter, my girlfriend's place, or her husband's, but when no one did, I couldn't help myself. I, uh, was the one steak and potatoes going to be for all of us? Or, my girlfriend explained, in the tone you'd use for a tourist violating a sacred local taboo. My mom always has the waiter put the kids' food in first, so it can get started right away. We'll order once the kitchen has hers. I thought she was joking, since Ellen didn't just order her kids' food. She also ordered her own dinner too. 
So I laughed. Something funny? Ellen asked. Then I realized she was serious and I shut up. Thankfully, her dad at least recognized that what was normal for them might not be as regular to me and tried to lighten the mood with a change of topic. But not even 10 minutes after we had ordered, I guess technically 5 minutes after we had ordered, 10 minutes after she and her daughter had ordered, Ellen started in again. Another table that had been there long before we were got a side order of mashed potatoes with their meal. Ellen threw a total conniption. She was sputtering so inaudibly that none of us could figure out what was wrong at first. Finally, she managed to flag down some busboy who barely spoke English and began laying into him like he had just sideswiped her on the freeway. He kept trying to explain he wasn't a server and he could go get one, but she wouldn't stop to breathe long enough for him to find someone who could actually help. All the while, I kept looking at my girlfriend for signs of embarrassment or at the very least irritation, but you wouldn't have known if she was even hearing any of this. Our waiter came over, somehow still feigning a smile despite knowing what he was walking into, and Ellen actually goes, Why did that table get mashed potatoes and ours haven't come yet? The waiter kindly but concisely explained, Well, ma'am, those people ordered potatoes before your party had placed their order. Ellen looks this man dead in the eye, finally, and says, Well, it doesn't matter when they ordered it. My daughter is the youngest one here. Her food should come out first. You could tell the waiter was working hard to restrain himself at this point. He explained it was a first-come, first-served policy, and age didn't help one way or the other. He offered to go check on the potatoes. Ellen agreed, and more specifically, she said, Yeah, you better. But I was clocking him, and he went right back to his server station, because we had only just ordered a few minutes ago. Three or five more minutes passed, during which we could have no other discussion at the table except how awful this restaurant was, how hungry the poor baby was, who hadn't said a word about being hungry this whole time and was contently playing her loud iPad game without headphones, disturbing all of the other diners around us, and how America has lost all respect for motherhood because it's just a me, me, me culture now. I chimed in. I'm with you on that last part. And to my utter shock, instead of laughing at my joke, my girlfriend seemed annoyed with me. So after a few minutes, the waiter comes back and says the potatoes will be out very soon. Ellen then goes and does something that, again, I thought was just a myth. She took three singles and a five out of her wallet and put them on the table in full view of the waiter. Then she took one single away and said, Every table I see getting potatoes before us is a bill gone. I was absolutely mortified. The waiter, to his unending credit, just took a deep breath and said, I don't have control over the order in which the kitchen fires tickets, but what I can tell you is it should be out any minute, and left without saying anything disparaging. I had been holding my tongue all night as well in the name of my relationship, but once the tip hit the table, the $8 tip for a $100 plus bill, on top of all else, I figured if my girlfriend was half the woman I thought she was, then she wouldn't mind me speaking up at this point. If anything, she'd be supportive, right? So I scooted my chair back a bit and said, Listen, I know what you're doing with the cash on the table, but that kind of thing makes me really uncomfortable, and it's just not called for. Please put the money away, or we can just continue this some other time. My girlfriend's dad spits back. What? How cheap do you have to be to not believe in tipping service workers? Before I could process whether he was serious or yanking my chain, Ellen shocked me with, No, you know what? You're right. This isn't necessary. I should have known better than to be relieved. She folded the bills back into her wallet, patiently waited for the next plate of mashed potatoes to be carried out, and when it wasn't delivered to us, it was a very common side dish at this place, a steakhouse, she went right up to a stranger's table and picked it up off of their table. She half explained something about her daughter starving as she was walking away with the stranger's food, but unsurprisingly, that wasn't convincing enough for them. The old lady she took it from followed right behind her over to our table and tried to take it back. I was already searching for my coat tag in preparation to go, but a shoving match was beginning to unfold between Ellen and an elderly woman with a tennis ball walker, and far be it from me to sit through all that happening only to leave just as the night was getting interesting. The elderly woman was like, Give me back my potatoes! Who are you? And the poor girl was like, Mommy, it's okay. Don't take someone else's potatoes. But it all fell on deaf ears. Ellen yelled at the old lady. How could you just sit there and eat those when my daughter hasn't even been served yet? She's sitting here hungry and you're over there stuffing your face. 
Come on, other potatoes will be out any minute. And the old lady, got a lover, was like, Great, if they'll be out any minute, then what's the darn problem? To which Ellen still found her holier-than-thou ground, gasping. Language, please. Finally, the waiter, and this time someone higher up as well, I think the manager, thank God, came over to separate them as they had begun to raise their voices and cause a disturbance. Staff had already asked Ellen to turn down her daughter's iPad multiple times without heed, and I'm guessing the waiter informed management about the tip on the table stunt she pulled because this was their final straw. They told us we were going to have to leave the restaurant. But we don't have our food yet, Ellen complained at the guy. This was clearly not the manager's first rodeo. You can take the food that's already been served free of charge. Everything else will be canceled. Please leave immediately. The old lady didn't miss her chance to knock the potatoes right onto the floor so we couldn't try to take them with us. Nothing else had been served yet, so we had to leave without any food. When my girlfriend and I were finally alone in our car, she said, Can you believe that? And I said, Not at all. And I really can't believe you didn't warn me. And she went, How could I have known about any of that? And confused, I asked, Is she not usually like that? Even more confused than me, my girlfriend asked, Who? Your mom? What's my mom got to do with a terrible service at the place? That was the beginning of the end of our relationship. The fact she didn't see anything wrong with her mom's behavior and that I'd be marrying into that situation shook me too deep. We both dodged a bullet in more ways than one. In hindsight, we weren't right for each other, regardless of who her family was. Her mom saved us both a lot of time and heartache, helping me realize in one night what would have probably taken us years otherwise. Within a month, we had moved into separate apartments and gone on a break that ended up lasting forever. I'm not sorry I won't see you again, Ellen. I am sorry any waitstaff ever will, though. Would you still marry someone if you found out that their mother acted like this? Or not? Please let us know. I hope they left a horrible Yelp review. Help destroy my trust in humanity? I put you on the news. Once upon a time, I, almost 49, female, had an extremely close friend, Mindy. Heck, she was not just my friend, she was like a sister. We met in grade school. She pursued my friendship, always tried to sit next to me, always wanting to talk. Over the years, we would spend lots of time at each other's houses, but by the time we were 19, my house was our meeting place because she had extremely bad family trouble. My parents kind of informally took her in because they sympathized with her situation. I always tried to make her feel like she belonged and avoided luxurious stuff if she could not afford it. Expensive shows, nice clothes she might like but could not wear. Other times, I just gave her some stuff from my closet. She was nice, outspoken, and made me feel like I had the most loyal friend on the planet. The years go by. I'm fresh out of college and got a nice job. Mindy's life has improved. She had her own place and a 9 to 5 very reliable job. By then, we had a group of friends, all young professionals trying to make our way. I remember that time in my life as bittersweet. We would often reminisce on our college days and because this happened in the 90s, there were no social networks, no texting. If you wanted to get in touch, you had to exchange phone numbers or emails. Now it's fairly easier. So exchanging old stories clued us together as we wondered how things worked out for friends we may never see again. Gatherings and get-togethers happened in my apartment. I loved that place. It was spacious, still half empty, because I was careful not to throw too much money into decoration. Around those days, Mindy began to look sickly and quite not herself. I was worried and loved her to death. She had been there for me, especially when my fiancé broke up with me for no reason. I guess we now call it ghosting. He was the first man I ever truly loved. I was never able to get him to express his love like I did, but I accepted him for who he was. He had some cold stages which left me wanting, but I thought I could manage. Basically, I was settling for being breadcrumbed. He was gorgeous, successful, and protective, so when he proposed, I was on cloud nine and decided to ignore the negatives. I had saved a lot of money for our wedding. To be fair, he did the same in a separate banking account. Things came to an end when all of a sudden, he broke up with me. He told me he did not want to get married and did not love me nor wanted any type of relationship. He let me keep the money from our joint account plus some of his things at the apartment, workout bench, clothing, pretty much everything. This had a bad effect on me. I felt like he despised me and wanted to cut ties no matter the cost. Invitations had not been issued, so calling off the engagement was not such an ordeal. Mindy was there for me, listening to my pain, my rants and endless sobbing. 
I lost so much weight, I was embarrassed to be seen out on the street. She had a boyfriend, George, and he was awesome about letting me crash at their place whenever anguish and pain hit me hard. They both cut ties with my ex. I had made so many life-altering decisions for him only to be left in the dark. Mindy and George sat me down and disclosed that my ex was seeing someone else. I remember the shock and emotional pain. My heart was racing and I ran to the bathroom because the bad news made me throw up. I never understood how my ex treated me like that. That Christmas was so bad. I would sit in my living room staring at the wall. Mindy and George had helped me set up a very 90s looking Xmas tree to cheer me up. Only white lights, a few golden ornaments and natural pine. I was so depressed the tree stayed put until next spring. By summer, Mindy broke some devastating news. She was very ill. I was so angry. She didn't deserve this. Her diagnosis was grim. So bad that George proposed earlier than he had planned because he wanted to live in the moment. She had always dreamed of a huge wedding. It was her obsession. We would go into bridal shops and try as many dresses as possible when we were teenagers. The wedding of her dreams was now out of the question. Her family would not pitch in. She had left their home on very bad terms and George could not pay it on his own. George was now barely out of medical school and up to his neck in debt. I decided to pay for her wedding. It would be a very small event, but I would make sure the decorations and her dress were as dreamy as she had always wanted. I still had the money I had saved for my wedding and as financially risky or stupid as it may have sounded back then, I was sure those final days with Mindy would be worth gold when she was gone. Her illness made me realize that there are worse things in this life other than being unceremoniously dumped by my ex. I threw myself into it. I was also happy and hopeful as Mindy was able to get her chemo sessions by herself without becoming too sick. She also looked much better than the other patients. Our group of friends also helped her a lot. There was not a day when someone would not bring her groceries or help pay for a random utility bill as she was now out of work. I had initially offered to help her set up a better health insurance plan, but she declined. Pay attention to this, more on this later. So I decided not to intrude and give her the fairy tale wedding, or as close to it that I could, that she wanted. She had picked a nice rental dress and tiara. The florist was to accommodate her taste and create an indoor garden. The venue would be my apartment. The baker had been retained for a six-tier wedding cake. There would be 35 people with tables, an aisle, and a musician to play some music. We could not do the loud disc jockey thing. Now back to the insurance issue. My first job was as a junior sales executive for a health insurance company. There was a legal dispute against another insurer and I was called in by the court to be a witness. As I was getting cleared to enter the building, I saw my ex. My stomach churned. I immediately thought, courtroom wedding. By the time I reached for the elevator, he had already vanished. That messed up my day. I relived the lack of closure all over again. I could not let it go. I contacted a good friend who I knew was doing her law internship at the court district. She helped me by checking any legal records regarding my ex. No court wedding. I was relieved. I know it sounds silly, but there was a fraud claim and he was the plaintiff. I didn't make much of it, but it was strange. He was very smart and getting scammed out of his money sounded too uncharacteristic. I still wanted to help Mindy and tried to set her up with a good insurance plan. I knew it was difficult given that companies treated patients like her as money dumping risks. I pleaded with my old boss and he searched her name, but she was not in the company database. Maybe she was using a different insurer, but that was odd because she clearly told me what her insurance company was. I felt guilty because I kind of was snooping. Things were normal for a month until my friend at the courthouse broke some disgusting news. The defendant in my ex's lawsuit was my best friend, Mindy. She asked me if I knew anything about it. I had no idea or clue. She then disclosed that the case had become popular gossip among courtroom clerks because my ex had fallen for a complicated Cupid scam. As it turned out, Mindy and my ex had an affair behind George's back and mine. It spanned a full year, and she was not out of work. She had been fired for embezzlement and larceny, stealing from an employer. I did know that she kept moving apartments, but I thought she had been trying to save on rent, so she had kept looking for cheaper and cheaper places. She moved around towns in the same city. First, she took my ex's money for some investment and she used her former employer's credibility for it. Never got too many details. Then she got him to help her with medical bills and scammed him out of close to $20,000. Her illness was fake. I avoided her for a week. I hired a private investigator to help me get whatever I could without much hope as their affair had ended. 
The investigator managed to help me get some closure. His name was on her lease for a small studio. Everyone in the building thought they were a couple. It was their love nest and it was two hours away. I never suspected anything, but apparently he had been lying to me about his actual working hours. He had also helped cover for her car payment at least six times in a year. She had my ex as her sugar daddy. She had seen me cry, puke, curl on my bed and had broken the news that he had someone else herself. My ex seemed salty over the fact that she had chosen to stick with George. It was simple math. My ex was very successful, but George, although not wealthy yet, had become a physician and was spoken for to start a small practice with a potential partner. She upped and left and cheated him out of money along the way. Apparently, my ex figured out she had been lying about her condition. The disgust, pain, and disappointment hit me fairly hard, but somehow, I had so heavily invested myself into helping her that I had emptied myself of any potential nerve-wracking reaction. I was numb. I went straight to all the wedding vendors and canceled before it was too late to get my money back. I defunded her wedding. No cake, no dress, and no veil. I sat down with George on a Friday afternoon and offered him all evidence and proof. He cried, but at the end admitted to feel painfully relieved. Yes, he loved her, but he had felt pressured to get married. He confessed to many red flags. She always went to her medical appointments by herself and became irritated if he asked too many questions. She had shown him some test results that were incredibly well-crafted, but now knowing what she had done, he thought the medical documents could be fake. He confirmed the sneaky way, having his nurse, ex-roommate, run her name in the computer at where she claimed to be her doctor's office. It was logical on her part as back then a fairly small town had only one oncologist. We also suspected that she may have been having a new affair as she spent more and more weekends with her all-girls church camping group. She claimed it was her sanctuary and helped her a lot. It may have been a front. George and I accepted the fact that we had been cheated, taken advantage of, and emotionally destroyed by the same person. I personally felt a loss of innocence. Now I understood why she wanted to keep her wedding thing almost a secret. It may have been impossible that making it public may have blown her cover one way or the other. George and I decided to do what was right. I paid for a video tribute to my loyal friend and decided to send it to the local news as a heartwarming story of love and healing. It featured her and George's apartment compound on purpose so that everyone wanting to serve her court papers could find her. I did not want to see her and I made up excuses, but George had a hard time feigning happiness once she had returned from her camping trip. It was an agonizing week. The news wasn't showing our positive note yet and we were sick with the waiting. It all blew up on Tuesday morning. The news channel enthusiastically showcased our story with a collage and lots of information about her and how she was about to get married and had almost already beaten cancer. Dozens of ill-spoken haters popped up from out of nowhere. As it turns out, this had been her second illness story. I never knew someone so close to me could lead such a scummy double life. My ex went straight to the channel and was interviewed. Oh man, it was pathetic. He poured his heart out about how crazy in love he had been and how she had only used him. I think by then he did not care if all our friends and families found out what he had done. George confronted her with all of the information. She denied it, then said it was a lapse of bad judgment. She moved out without too much drama. It took George over a decade to forgive himself for allowing someone to make him look so stupid as a person and as a physician. She left me some voicemails with lots of excuses. I picked up the phone only once and told her I had defunded and pulverized her wedding and that it was me who told George what was going on. I used a leveled voice to tell her to never call me again unless she wanted to find out how far I would go to see her pay for her unlawful actions. I cried immediately after I hung up. It was so surreal. George and I slowly found normality, but it took some time. He dated a couple of girls here and there, but was not ready. I myself became shut down. She avoided jail, I don't know how, even when our mutual friends filed petty claims for all of the money they invested buying her stuff while she carried on her false pretenses. Eventually, I used the wedding money to partner with George and we opened a small clinic. Best decision ever. Over the years, George and I became best friends and grew closer. We got married some years ago and are proud parents to a happy family. Fun fact, I got a Facebook message from her seven years ago. She began very sweetly, but then proceeded to blame me and accused me of stealing her man and her life. I blocked her. Fun fact too, I ran into my ex in 2001. He apologized profusely. 
I accepted his apology and told him it all worked out as I now have a life with someone who truly deserves me. Back then, George and I had begun dating. Fun Fact 3 Mindy avoided doing time for her deeds back then, but was prosecuted eventually for more fraud. Am I the jerk for asking my girlfriend to pay for my new prosthetic leg? I, male 24, was in an accident around two years ago that resulted in losing my left leg. I thought that would be the end of my active lifestyle. I loved all kinds of sports as a kid and still do. I had a very hard time adjusting to my new normal. My parents were able to get me a prosthetic leg that allowed me to get back to running and going on trips with my friends like we always did every summer. The guys were planning an RV trip on the weekend. We had already chosen a destination which was spending some time out in nature and a getaway from stress. My girlfriend asked if she could come along. I told her no, this is a guy's trip. Told her all my buddy's girlfriends wanted to go but they were firm and put their foot down. She laughed at me for this then tried to convince me to let her come because she was stressed out from being at home 24 hours a day. I already made up my mind. I wasn't going to ruin the trip just because she wants to be on a guy's trip. I promised her a trip when I got back. She got upset and didn't like the idea. Later on, before I went to sleep, I took my prosthesis off as I do every night. This is my second prosthesis. I've already completed a wearing schedule during first year and had to get another prosthesis to accommodate any physical changes I had. I woke up in the morning and I couldn't find my prosthesis. I looked where I put it, but it was gone. I asked my girlfriend, who was doing heavy cleaning around the place, and she said she didn't see it. I was confused that it wasn't near my bed. I asked her to stop being childish and playing games and give me back my prosthesis because I know she took it. She's a bad liar and couldn't even deny it. She said she wanted to hide it so that I won't go on that trip and leave her alone. I got mad at her for this. I was stunned to find my prosthesis hidden underneath an auto part in the garage. It had been damaged. It was placed in a position where it had cracked. It was obvious it no longer functions properly. I mean, I could still wear it, but couldn't put my whole weight on it because it would break. I yelled at her and showed her what she did. She said she didn't mean it. I told her she did mean it because she was being childish and jealous over a trip and now she cost me $7,000 worth of damage. I told her she ruined everything, that she owed me a new one, and that she needed to pay for a new one. She got mad and left. I basically had to use my old crutches and it felt absolutely horrible. I called the guys and told them I wasn't coming. It's been a few days. She's mad that I'm still asking her to pay for a new prosthesis and called me a jerk for not apologizing and preferring a plastic leg over her. I had to call my parents today to tell them and they told me she should at least help pay half of the expenses for a new prosthesis since she caused damage to it and then consider my relationship with her. Have I been a jerk to her? Edit. For those asking about where I am, I'm in Asia from the Philippines. Karen threatens to sue a bakery over a cake. Today was my aunt's birthday, so it reminded me of something funny that happened two years ago. First, a little bit of context. My aunt really likes cakes, but her favorite ones are from a bakery chain that only has two stores in our city, both of which open at 10 a.m. from Monday to Saturday and at 11 a.m. on Sundays. This story took place on a Sunday. Now, the place normally sells cakes of one or two kilograms each, but if you want a cake of three kilograms or more, you have to make your order within one day of anticipation and can pick it up as soon as the bakery opens. Now, as my aunt's party was mostly going to be a small reunion with just our closest family present, my mom decided to just buy a two kilogram cake since it's easier, especially because the bakery isn't exactly near our house and you can't just call to have your cake made. You have to go to the store and leave 50% of the money. So that day we arrived a few minutes before the opening hour and stood there waiting for the employees to open up the doors. The place had some pretty large windows too, meaning you could look inside and see the employees cleaning the place, bringing the cakes from the back and into the fridges and such. It was then that the devil herself arrived. A typical Karen with blonde hair, expensive looking clothing, lots of makeup, two mini monsters, aka kids, and that I'm better than everyone else attitude. She tried pushing the doors open despite the sign that read closed and me and my mom standing there quite obviously waiting for the place to open. More so, it wasn't even 11 a.m. yet. But still, she huffed and shook her head in exasperation as if the door had somehow wronged her. Ugh, I can't believe they haven't opened yet, she complained loudly, looking at us as if we were going to agree with her. We just stared at her like she was crazy. It is very disrespectful to keep us here waiting. 
I can't believe this lack of professionalism. My mom just nodded her head, and we both proceeded to ignore her until the clock struck 11, at which point she started pretty much banging on the door and demanding loudly that someone open the store, saying she would sue them and have their jobs and whatever. I had to turn around so she couldn't see me trying to contain my laughter. It was such a funny sight, seeing a full-grown adult throwing up a tantrum just because a bakery hadn't opened exactly at 11 a.m. I actually suspect that this made the employees not want to open since it took them about five more minutes to let us inside. And of course, the Karen went full, I want to speak to your manager, as soon as she stepped inside. Meanwhile, my mom and I went to look at the cakes, trying to decide which one we'd buy, but we couldn't help overhearing her. This is such a huge disrespect. She was screeching to the poor manager. Do you even know who I am? I work for a law firm, and I can't be wasting time here waiting for your lazy staff to open. I'll sue you. I really don't know what she was trying to accomplish with this huge tantrum, because as soon as the manager offered to give her a discount, she was like, No, forget it. I won't be buying anything from you ever again. And with that, she grabbed her kids and stormed out of the store, but not without stopping at the door and looking to my mom, saying, You can have this stupid cake. Turns out, her cake was not only a 3 kilogram cake, but it was made of blackberries instead of strawberries, like the normal cakes, which made it more expensive. But coincidentally, it was also my aunt's favorite. And not only that, Karen had already paid for half of it. My mom and I just looked at each other, smirked, and brought the cake to the counter. And the employee was very happy to sell it to us. Guess some good things can come out from encountering a Karen in the wild. Speaking of cake, what's your favorite flavor cake of all time? Please let us know. Mm, I'll go with all of the above. Am I the jerk for not saying I love you to my daughter? My youngest daughter is 22. Whenever she calls, she ends her calls with love you and I say you too. On our last talk, right when we were about to get off the line, she asked, why don't you ever say I love you back? I told her, because meaningful love is shown through actions. And she said, I want you to say it. And I said, sweetie, you can't force me to say it. Then she said, then I guess I won't talk to you again until you're ready. I thought she was joking, but when I walked in the living room, my wife was on the phone with her and she said, wait hun, your dad just walked in. And she said that she didn't want to talk to me unless I said I loved her. Even my wife laughed because, listen, nobody on my side of the family says I love you. My parents never said it to my siblings and I. My biological uncles and aunts don't say it. And my grandparents don't say it. They would say things like, I'm proud of you. You make me so happy. I'm so glad you're my child. I don't know what I would do without you. And so on. All things I've told my children growing up. We believe that love is a given and shown through actions. So I get awkward when girlfriends would say it and expect me to say it back. I never did. I never said I love you to my wife or any of my four daughters and three sons or anybody in my whole life. But what I think is that my older kids grew up when a lot of my side of the family were still alive, so they understand where I got it from. My youngest daughter mostly grew up around my wife's family, who says, I love you all the time. Still, some people might say, oh, just say it. It won't cost you anything. But to me, it will. It's cheap to me. By saying it, it would feel to me that all the love I've shown to her through my actions over the years were meaningless. Well, what do you think? Do you agree with OP or his daughter? Please let us know. Bruh. He liked his stolen watch so much, he came back to buy one. I used to work as assistant store manager at a retailer of primarily watches and leather goods. At this particular location where I worked, we had three points of entry and never much staff working, two to five depending on the time of day and the day of the week. The floor plan was set up so that even if you were trying really hard, while also not helping any customers, you could barely see two entrances at once. Additionally, we only kept about 20% of our display product under glass and had no security guard, and our watches were all in the $500 to $2,000 range. It was an LP nightmare, and uniformed officers and detectives got pretty used to visiting at least monthly, if not weekly, during busy shopping seasons to take down theft reports and to follow up on them. It was stressful, tedious, and probably the worst part of the job. One busy summer weekend day, when I was the only manager on duty, we noticed two watches were missing from their displays, so I had to step off the floor to review our security camera footage. 
we had something like 10 different cameras, and throughout my tenure at this retailer, I had gotten extremely proficient at snipping footage and capturing stills from our security cameras to provide to our LP team and the police department. So while reviewing the footage, I found some great angles of the culprit concealing watches and a pretty good shot of his face from where he entered the store. Needless to say, I knew what the guy looked like. We informed the other retail location in our area that we had been hit, only to find out that the guy had gone straight there and, in the short amount of time it took us to figure out the watches were missing and review the footage, he had already returned one of the watches for store credit. Bold. Cut to about a month later. I'm the only manager working again, and guess who enters the store? The shoplifter. He has returned to the scene of the crime, and guess what? He's brought his fiance. And guess what else? He's wearing the watch he stole and wants to use his store credit to buy another watch as a gift for his business associate. Knowing that the best deterrent to shoplifting is excellent customer service, this is something I learned in luxury retail that has worked pretty well in my experience since you can keep an eye on things while also not being the jerk whose behavior is blatantly accusatory. I started helping the guy as he and his fiance shopped while also whispering to all my associates that we needed to watch him because he had stolen from us before. He shops with us for about an hour, playing up how excited he is about his watch and about getting one for his associate. But folks, he had no clue who he was up against. Five years of improv training, anyone? On the sales floor, I'm all smiles, trying on watches with him and his fiance. But in the couple of moments I get to walk away and hand them off to my associate, I'm able to sneak off into the office to call the police and to confirm from my footage that this is 100% our guy. By the end of the interaction, I'm in the cash wrap with my associate who is gift wrapping the new watch, and our thief kind of corners us to see what we're up to. We can feel him getting progressively more antsy, which is reasonable since we're taking our sweet time finishing the transaction as we await the cops. We assure him our system is just slow, and he sees my associate clearly trying to perfect the gift's bow. After we finish the transaction and handed him his ill-gotten wares, we watch as he hurries his comfortably seated fiancé out of her chair so they can get the heck out of Dodge. They exit and we see him through our window fumbling with his phone to reactivate the app-based rideshare moped they were using to travel. As he's doing this, the cops cruise by and stop just a few car lengths ahead. They get out of their car and as they approach our door, I look at them with wide eyes, frantically pointing out our thief. They go and arrest the guy literally just as he's sitting down on the moped with his fiance, who is visibly baffled by this development. After all this was said and done, the detectives come and commend me on doing their job for them. Shoplifting arrests after the fact rarely happen, so they were pleased to close a case. And I end up looking the guy up because he gave his real name for the transaction and I find out he's some kind of a jet-setting yoga instructor. I did see his yoga instructor bio, who travels the world and literally has Instagram posts of him wearing his stolen watch. Clearly, the guy could have afforded it, but got some kind of thrill from shoplifting and returning to the scene of the crime. As for the fiancé, while I have sympathy for her, it's probably better she found out about his kleptomania before saying I do. Anyway, I left that job a few weeks later to work at another company, where I'm happy to report that I haven't had to file a single police report for the entire year I've been there. Have you ever seen anyone shoplifting? And if so, what did you do about it? Please let us know. Oh, how I love the five finger discount. Am I the jerk for choosing my son's now ex-girlfriend over him? Everything is a gigantic mess right now and I don't know if I'm doing the right thing. I have a son named Will who's 22. His mother and I split when he was four and we shared custody. For over a year, Will has been going out with his girlfriend, Elise, who's 19 and they moved in together five months ago. She's a very sweet and respectful girl, and I thought they made a nice couple. Well, almost two months ago, I heard from my ex-wife that Will kicked Elise out after he found out she was pregnant. I didn't want to believe that was the only reason and called Will. He explained to me that Elise told him she was pregnant, and he was furious with her because she wanted to keep it. He said he wants nothing to do with her or the baby, and he's not going to pay a cent. I was appalled by his attitude about all of this and reminded him that it takes two to make a baby and he needs to own up to his actions. Will said it was all Elise's fault for not wanting to get rid of the baby. He was far too upset and I felt myself getting angry too. I told him I'd call again when he's calmed down. I reached out to Elise and she was a mess. The poor girl was terrified. She said she didn't expect Will to react this way. I found out she was forced to stay at a friend's house because her parents are also refusing to let her move back because she shamed them. 
I talked with my wife and we agreed to have Elise come live with us in our spare bedroom. I've spoken to Will many times and he's still adamant about not being involved or at the very least helping out financially because he doesn't want to be a dad or to ruin his life. Our last talk, I got so furious with him, I said if he doesn't want to accept any responsibility for his child, then I will do the same and have nothing to do with him. My ex-wife called me because Will complained I was siding with Elise over him and said I don't have to cut contact with him over this. We had our own fight, but I refused to budge. It's been a few weeks like this now without any contact. Will has tried calling me several times and left many angry voicemails and texts saying I betrayed him. I had to block him. It just breaks my heart and I'm wondering where exactly we went wrong as parents. Where I went wrong. I really thought we raised him better than this and taught him that in life, it's always important to take responsibility for your actions and now he's completely running away from them. My ex is very angry with me for turning my back on him even if she doesn't agree with what he's doing either. My wife and I decided we would help Elise with the baby and all other expenses and that she's free to stay with us as long as she needs to. But this whole thing with Will, I don't know if it was a bad move as a father or not, or if I'm being a jerk. I guess that's what I'm here to ask. What would you say to your son if he was acting like Will? Please let us know. Mm, I'd like to speak to his manager to be honest. Crazy roommates won't let us use their stuff anymore? No problem. In college, my friend and I moved into a 4-4 off campus. We were randomly placed with two girls who were friends. Their apartment was already decorated to the nines and I have a sneaking suspicion they were in need of roommates because they were completely psychotic who really needed to be in an apartment by themselves. Initially, they were kind, though the vibe was always a little weird. Again, their apartment was meticulously designed for a college apartment. In the beginning, they were open to letting us use things like kitchen supplies. But the catch was that they were petty about how and when we used them, cleaned them, etc. They would get upset if things weren't placed exactly where we had found them. They had rules for everything, and the very tenuous and cordial friendship we had with them quickly broke down. Pretty soon, my friend and I were getting condescending essays posted to the fridge about how we hadn't dried off the recycling enough before putting it in the bin, for example. Once my friend and I had had enough and began pushing back against their rules by simply voicing that they were sharing an apartment, not having two house guests in their apartment, everything went to crap. They stopped talking to us, would hide in their rooms when we were there. One of them had a cat and he disappeared. She would hide him in her tiny room whenever we were around. They posted a letter saying we could no longer use anything in their home, the trash bin, utensils, bowls, placements, and we were not allowed to touch her cat. While in talks with the property managers about getting the heck out of there, my friend and I went to Walmart and bought the most hideous, infantile, cheap crap that would clash with their decor as much as possible. Elmo and Doc McStuffins placemats, those alphabet magnets, which we placed all over the fridge. A second, giant trash can and recycle bin, our own Walmart level home decor, picture frames, and knickknacks. Every room we were in, we would move things just slightly off center. Picture frames, placemats, a picture on the fridge. We also spent as much time as possible in the commons area laughing and having a grand old time. The property managers ended up allowing us to move out into another apartment for free because the two girls refused to meet with us and the property managers to discuss what was going on. I still hate those jerks, but I loved my Elmo placemat. Edit. I would like to make it clear that my roommate and I genuinely tried our best to be respectful, polite, and kind to these girls and their things when we first moved in. We were not messy and always cleaned up after ourselves. I even spent time drying off recycling, but there was never any winning. They always took issue with something. They needed to find a 2-2 apartment. After they forbid us from using their things, they went so far as to physically remove two of the four placemats. We had no choice but to supply our own. We went on living in the apartment as we would have, including continuing to clean up after ourselves, but we were able to live a little on our own terms, even if it was just a stupid placemat. I got petty revenge on two guys that walked out on their checks. I'm a 30-year-old pencil pusher by now, so this story is not recent. It happened about 9 years ago when I was still in college. During that time, I served at a smaller diner, 14 tables total, a bar with about 10 seats and more seating on the patio located in a suburban town that also boasted a small college, which I attended. This place was frequented by some of the best people you'll ever meet. I loved working there and making relationships with regulars and strangers alike. In fact, I'm still in contact with some of my regulars nine years later. 
Of course, there were difficult and belligerent customers at times, but the good experiences far outweighed the bad. I miss it to be honest. One story leaped out of my brain today when I discovered this subreddit. This diner was a very popular breakfast and lunch spot. Dinner was spotty, but we still did pretty well. From 7 a.m. to 1.30 p.m., we were usually at capacity. This story occurred on one particular Labor Day, and it was hot outside. The street on which this restaurant was located was hosting a Labor Day parade, so we were more packed than usual from people who wanted to escape the heat and get a bite. I ran my butt off from open till the lunch rush died down around 2 p.m., made good money, provided good service, etc., etc. Since it was a holiday, we were closing early that day at 3 p.m. This was marked everywhere, including online. I only had two tables left at 2.30 p.m. when a family four-top came in. No problem, I seat them. I'm getting off early anyway, so it doesn't bother me if they stay past 3 p.m. But I noticed immediately that the father slash husband is very overweight and struggling mightily with the heat. I get him water, but he starts looking worse and eventually falls out of his chair after a few minutes. He's mostly unresponsive while I run to call 911 and get some cool moist towels to give to his wife. He unfortunately defecated during this incident. Poor guy. He kept saying how sorry he was and was clearly embarrassed even though he was clearly in pain. Not sure if it was a heat stroke or a heart attack and I never found out, but I'm running around trying to help this guy, holding the door as the paramedics come, moving chairs and tables to clear a path. That's not the story. The next part is. While I'm running around the restaurant, I'm still checking on my two tables. They've mostly finished, so I'm trying to get them out ASAP, as I assume they have lost their appetites. So I'm clearing plates and getting checks. I'm being somewhat neglectful of them, but hey, I can only do so much. Well, a two-top of college-aged guys decided, during all of this turmoil, to get up and leave without paying their checks. I didn't notice until the ambulance leaves and see that they are gone, the checks still on the table. I'm a little shook up, so I tell my manager that they walked out and he tells me to go find them. The manager was also the owner and is a great guy, so hopefully that doesn't make him sound bad. He was as angry as me. I'm not the most confrontational, but at that moment I wanted to find those guys, and I think they're college age. I've seen them around campus, so they probably didn't drive. Campus is only a few blocks away. I should probably start in that direction. But then I put on my detective hat. What would I do if I just got my endorphin rush from stealing from a restaurant on this hot day? Well, I would probably get a nice frosty treat from the Dairy Queen two blocks away. So I jog to the Dairy Queen, sweating like heck, and bust in like a man on a mission. And lo and behold, who do I see in line but my two forgetful customers from five minutes ago. They don't look incredibly thrilled to see me for some reason. I walk up to them and put the check in their face and politely tell them that they neglected to pay. They look ashamed and inform me that they were in a hurry. Of course, they weren't being opportunistic jerks. They were just in a huge rush to wait in line for ice cream. So I tell them, look, it's no problem. If you give me your card, I'll go cash you guys out and bring it back. These jerks actually give me a credit card and I walk back to the restaurant, charge the card, lock the front door as it's now after 3 p.m. and go about my side work in order to close down the front of the house. After about 20 minutes, they must have realized that I wasn't actually returning and showed up at the front door of the restaurant. I saw them approaching through the large front windows, so I slipped in my headphones and continued mopping. Unfortunately, I could not hear them knocking on the front door as I concentrated on my mopping and full view of my two former customers. It took me about 15 more minutes to finish cleaning the floors, at which point I looked up and put on my best surprise face to see them pounding on the door. I hold up a finger, tell them to wait, make my way slowly behind the counter, look confused, finally locate their receipt and credit card, walk slowly toward the door, need to be careful on the wet floor, open the door crack and hand it back their card, ask them to sign the receipt and promptly close the door after. They waddled off in sweaty silence. Karen keeps calling me creepy. So I've been living with my current roommate for two years now. I'm actually subletting and I'm on my second year, which is month to month, but we've had an unofficial verbal agreement that I'd stay until the end of the year. I mean, with everything going on right now, I didn't think I'd move either. Anyways, his girlfriend moved in the beginning of this year. It's been a lot. She's obviously been through some things in the past. I didn't dig, but I believe she had a home robbery a few years back. Well, when she first moved in, my roommate had some ground rules for me, so his girlfriend would be more comfortable. She obviously wasn't thrilled about having another roommate. He said I couldn't talk to her, like strike up a conversation if he wasn't there, because she doesn't want to have to talk to me if she didn't have to. 
He also said it would be best if we tried to not use the same facilities at the same time. Like if she's cooking in the kitchen, I should wait until she leaves before I grab food, etc. Like, yes, it's strange, but I figured it's his place, so whatever. I'm not trying to befriend her either. Things got worse in recent months because we've all been working from home. It's really hard to avoid someone 24-7, so obviously I've slipped up more. One time, I came home from Costco and offered her a spare bottle of coconut water I couldn't fit in the fridge. Big mistake. My roommate had to have a talk with me that night about how I should have known she would never drink my drinks and it's weird for me to even offer. The most recent one was when she was watching some Game of Thrones in our living room. I just absentmindedly watched a bit standing behind the couch. I laughed at a scene which startled her when she looked up and saw me standing behind her. I got another earful from my roommate about how I needed to stop creeping on her now that I'm home all the time. Long story short, my friend just had a place open up that's cheap and I'm gonna move. I told my roommate and he's upset because of our unofficial agreement and how he's probably gonna pay full rent for a while. I feel bad because yeah, I did say I wasn't gonna move, but I'm also pretty sick of both him and his girlfriend. However, I feel kind of guilty because I agreed to their weird rules before all of this started back when I thought it would be okay. So, you refuse to serve me unless I have an email? Not a long story, but it shook me when it happened. This happened a few weeks ago, so some of the details might be a little off. I was walking the floor when I hear one of the new girls, NG for short, call my name from Cash. I walk over to see what she needs help with. New girl, is there any way we can do an in-store order without getting the customer's email? Me, I don't think so, but let me go double check with the manager. I leave to go and find the manager and she confirms my thoughts. There is no way to make an order without an email. I walk back over to Cash to relay the information. When I get back, the new girl gives me a look that says I need to help her because these customers were being difficult. So I turn to the customer and address them when I spoke. Me. Unfortunately, my manager just confirmed that there is no way to place an online order without an email. Angry wife. Well, that's ridiculous. I don't feel comfortable giving out my email. Me. Then there is no way for me to complete this in-store order for you. Karen. So you're saying you won't serve me because I won't give you my email? Angry husband. Come on, let's go. We don't need to argue with the politics of this store. The husband walks away like he's going to leave, but the wife isn't done arguing yet. So, what happens if someone doesn't have an email? You won't serve them at all? Me. No, I'm not saying I can't serve you. All I'm saying is that I'm not able to place an online order for you. If you want these pants, we can always check if the other stores have them in stock. Does City X or City Y have any? City X and City Y were both very far away, more than a two-hour drive away from the location of my store. So not only was I a bit surprised that they asked for those stores, it also took a while for me to find their stock levels. My computer showed me the stock of other stores based on proximity. While I'm looking, I can tell that both of them are getting more annoyed with how long I'm taking. I finally find City X and City Y. Me. Yes, they do. City X has three and City Y has two. Then they leave in a huff. The new girl and I look at each other. New girl. Well, there's City X's problem now. We both laugh and I go back to walking the floor. Lady called the cops on me because we wouldn't give her a refund today. I work at an alternative clothing store in a large city. Because we're independent and our items are mostly undergarments, there is a no returns, no exchanges policy. Occasionally, managers will make exceptions, but us regular employees don't have that power. Today is my manager's day off. So when a customer called and angrily told me that the item she bought was defective, I had her email a photo in so I could have a manager look at it, but assured her it wouldn't be a problem. Fortunately, this corresponded with our web slash tech manager coming in and he gave me permission to refund her. Unfortunately, she was already on her way by the time I called her back and she was mad. She arrived steaming mad and already spouting angry threats and rude comments. Everything in the store is defective. But I just kept apologizing and started the refund only for my card machine to refuse to do it. Well, lucky for me, tech manager was there, so I had him come over and try to work it out. The whole time she's talking about how she's gonna leave us a bad review and she should have known better, etc. Well, unfortunately, the card machine is actually disabled for refunds and we can't re-enable it without the store owner who's not picking up her phone. Okay, that's not great and we apologize and tell her we can't do the refund now, but if she can come back another time, we'll be happy to since the system doesn't let you refund except to the original payment method. Cue her suddenly escalating to, I'm calling the cops, I demand a refund. 
my manager asking her to leave and telling her we'll call security. She calls the cops, I call security, and my manager shoos me away so I go outside to wait for them. Not long after she leaves in a flurry, I found out after my manager just gave her the cash value from his wallet and storms off to her car. Security shows up, we talk to them outside and let them know everything is fine and she stops in the middle of the road to shout out of her car at the security guys because she thinks they came to take her side. Karen goes crazy at the music store. This was a little while ago, so I'll be paraphrasing what was said, but I'll try my best to make it as accurate as possible. In the area I live in, there's probably two or three main music shops I know of, and two of which are in the same city, a few streets from each other. This particular store I went to has no uniform, but some form of ID. I think it was an ID card around their neck, but I haven't been there in a while, so I can't remember. At this time, I had been playing drums in school for about six months and decided I wanted to buy a drum kit for my house. This shop had the best prices, yada yada yada, so I decided to go there. As soon as I walk in, I spotted a mother and father with a kid, probably three or four, walking around. I went up to an employee and asked for recommendations and, funny enough, they gave me a recommendation. I hadn't been on an electronic drum kit before, but he was listing all the pros to them and the cons, and after plugging headphones in, he let me play and see how I felt. I'm a big guy, at the time I was 17 and was going to the gym a lot. I was probably a little over 100 kilograms at this time, but it was a mix of fat and muscle. One of the pros of this drum kit was that everything was movable so anyone could play and not feel cramped. Very useful for me. About two minutes in, I saw the mother, clearly the alpha of the family, marching towards me. I paid no attention. I was looking for a kid and maybe they were just on the way over here too. She stopped a meter away from me, crossed her arms and tapped her foot. I stopped playing, took one headphone off and the following conversation happened. Me. Hello? Entitled mom. Where would the best guitars be? Me. I'm not actually. Entitled mom cuts me off. You don't know? How would an employee not know? Me. I don't work here. She seemed unfazed by this info. Get me your manager, now. This is unacceptable behavior and a bad way of treating a customer. I just stared at her, almost dumbfounded at how she mistakes me for an employee. Sure, they had no uniform, but I wasn't wearing anything to ID myself as an employee. I'm pretty sure the dad knew I wasn't an employee, but was too afraid to even challenge her. I should also point out, I look much older than I am. I'm also rather hairy and have a badly kempt beard. Me. I do not work here. Entitled mom. Do not lie to me. I know you work here and I'll have you fired for this. I know the owner. I clearly displayed on my face my amusement. I started smiling, trying to control my laughter. Big mistake. She starts screeching at the top of her lungs, shouting and pointing at me, shouting about how I'm done and that I'm a bad employee. Actual employees came to calm the situation down a bit. I just sat back down and kept playing, and she kept shouting that I should be fired. She was eventually calmed down and taken to a separate part of the store. Now, I thought this is where it would end, and that I had a funny story to tell my friends and a memory to laugh at, but no. I decided not to get this version of the drum kit, but get a more advanced, upgraded version which they didn't have in stock. The other store, a few streets away, did, so I quickly walked there, asking for assistance and the same general process as before happened. I sat down and as I was putting the headphones on, she walks in, demanding to see the guitar section, and to my luck, it was right beside me. I played as normal, testing out the features and feeling the way it plays. The dad lifts the guitar despite it saying to ask for an employee to help and hands it to the son, who instantly drops it. In my attempt not to laugh, I fake coughed and looked away, but she had heard. She turns on her heel and, Do you know how rude? Why are you here? Me, don't work here either. I did as any normal, sane person would do, assume it's coincidence and move on. She, following the path of being senile, assumed I was obviously following her and harassing her, entitled mom. You followed us here. Me. I was here first. This clearly didn't matter as she called for security. Two guys, smaller than me, came over and asked if there was a problem. And before I could open my mouth, she said, Yes, he is harassing us. Smirking and smugly looking at me. At this point, I realized it could get serious. I stood up and said, Me. Check the security footage. I came in here first and didn't even talk to her. She approached me. 
The two guys, knowing I had come in first, said to her it'll be investigated. She was having none of this, and as expected, screaming, shouting, and flailing ensued. I turned to one of the guys and explained what had happened at the other store, and he brought me away and sorted out with a drum kit. In short, forget that jerk. Accusing a large built guy of this stuff could have went completely south and got me in serious trouble, but thankfully nothing came from it. I didn't believe people like this actually existed, but now I feel sorry for those who deal with them on a daily basis. Brofist to all those who deal with crazies every day. Entitled coworker becomes an entitled parent. This happened slash started about a year and a half ago. Entitled mom shows up at my desk one day at work. I've seen her at meetings, but never interacted directly with her. We work in different parts of the building for different functions. She's in customer service and I'm in supply chain. I'm several steps up the food chain and I don't know her name. Entitled mom. Are you? Says my name. Me, checking to see if my desk name place card disappeared. Um, yes. Okay, I heard you used to be in the military. Not a question, just a statement. Me, yes, I was. Okay, I heard you used to fix electronics. Is that true? Me, I did. I haven't done any of that work in about 10 years. Okay, but do you still know a lot about electronics? Me, not liking this conversation. Some things, yes, some things, no. But you could add a printer though, right? Me, I'm sorry, I have a meeting to go to in a few minutes. What do you want? Well, I need you to add a printer on my computer. Me, you know the step-by-step -step directions with screenshots are posted over all of the printers, right? And isn't IT right next to where you work? They can help if you need it. It would take you only a minute. I'm horrible at this kind of stuff, and IT is off-site today. Me, ah, <sighs> okay. Which printer do you want to add? Entitled mom looks at me like I'm stupid. The one closest to my desk. Me. Yeah, I figured that. But do you know the printer name? No. Can't you figure that out? Me. Listen, I'm due at a meeting in a few. I need to finish up a couple things beforehand. If you can't get anyone to help you in the next hour from your area, bring me the computer name and I'll show you how to add it. Can you come to my floor? That would be easier. Me. Not for me. If you really want my help, make sure you bring the printer name with you. I'll be back for my meeting in an hour. Entitled Mom walks off. My coworkers and I exchange glances and eye rolls and talk about how easy it is to follow the screenshots. I get to my meeting and forget all about Entitled Mom until a friend IMs me. Hey, what did you do to Entitled Mom? Me, not understanding the question's intent. I might be helping her add a printer if she can't figure it out by the end of the meeting. Any chance you can help her? Friend. But what did you do to her? She sounds upset and said you were really rude. Me. What? Does that even sound like me? I explain what happened. You can ask. Name of a friend we both know who is there. She was really pushy. I said I'd help her when I got out of this meeting if she couldn't figure it out. Can you help her? Friend. I'm on a call and I'm going to another meeting after. If I get out early, I'll try. Just thought you should know. She's down here complaining about you. Fast forward to the end of the meeting. I get back to my desk to drop off my computer and then go to the break room to get some tea. I walk back to my desk with a friend. Entitled mom is waiting for me, looking irritated. Entitled mom, I ate my cup of tea. So, you had a meeting? Me. Yes, then I got some tea. Were you able to figure it out? No, that's why I'm back. Can you hurry up and add the printer? I need to get this printed for this afternoon. Me. Hey, I'm offering to help you. I don't know you, and I hear you're complaining that I'm not being very helpful to your coworkers, and I don't even know you. Who said that? Do you want my help or not? Fine, I got the name like you said. Hands me a post-it. It read the words, HP LaserJet. I sigh. Listen, this isn't the name. Who's someone who sits near you that could run over to the room and check for us? I, I am her coworker who promptly sends me a screenshot and says they offered to help her earlier, but Entitled Mom said I was going to. Ah, <sighs> and I walk over to the printer room. I make her follow the directions and the screenshots herself, and it's set up in a couple of minutes. Entitled Mom. See? Was that so hard? Me. No, it really wasn't complicated at all. Next time, just give it a shot first, and then ask IT for help. Or lots of people in your area can do this, like the person we IM'd for the printer name. Thanks. See you later. Cheerfully goes off. I forgot all about it until the next day. I'm working, and I hear a happy voice say, Hi, it's me again. Thanks again for all your help yesterday. Me, feeling annoyed, but relenting a bit because she sounds like she's being nice. 
Oh, you're welcome. Everything work okay? Yeah, I got everything printed out just in time. Hey, I was telling my family about how you used to work on electronics, and my son has a question. Can you do a mod to his Xbox? This is where I make a giant error. I should have said no and just left it there. Instead, I say something like, It's been a long time. I think the last one I did was a Gen 2 Xbox while I was deployed. Oh, good. So you'll do it? Me, backpedaling hard. No, I can't. I don't even have the equipment to do that, and there are a lot of problems with making mods, like I could break the machine and it would completely void the warranty. I said a bunch of other stuff too about why it was a bad idea. But my son really wants the mod, and everyone else wants too much money for it. They want like $50, and we'd have to buy the mod ourselves. Me. Well, yeah, it takes time, and the mod is more than $50. What you're paying for is a lot of skill and knowing how to solder. Again, I wouldn't know how to do any mods these days, and I don't have the equipment to do this anymore. It would cost you more to buy the equipment than to pay someone else. Even if I could do it, I'm not willing to. But he really wants it, and he doesn't want to pay that much. He says you can use the electronics lab at his school. At this point, one of my coworkers has had enough and tells her, Listen, he doesn't want to do it, and he said no. Either pay someone who will, or tell your son he can't have it. Entitled mom looks shocked and leaves in a huff, saying, You don't have to be so rude about it. I figured that was the last I'd see of her, but no. My friend who works near her IMs me a little later and says she's going off. I find out who her manager is and set up a meeting with him a few days later. He shows up for the meeting with her in tow. We get into the room and he kicks it off. Thanks for taking the time to meet with us. I hope we can work out whatever conflict you're having. I've told Entitled Mom I want to stay unbiased, so I haven't heard her side yet. Can you tell me why you think you're having issues working with Entitled Mom? Me. What? Manager. Well, tell me your side of things, and then she can tell me hers, and then we can talk about it. This guy thinks he's here to resolve a conflict. Me. Well, she's being extremely rude. Entitled Mom, spluttering. Manager, looking frustrated but patient. Can we stick to the facts and avoid any kind of name-calling? Me. Okay, I'm just frustrated. She wants me to make a modification to her son's Xbox, and I'm not able to do it or willing to. Manager. I'm sorry. What do- Entitled Mom cuts in. He wants me to spend money to hire someone else to do it. I already told him he could use the electronics lab at his school. Manager. Um, Entitled Mom, is this work-related? Entitled Mom. Well, at first it was. He wouldn't help me install my printer. I finally got him to, and when I asked him to help my son, he refused. And one of the other people he works with was really mean about it. He made it personal. Me. Leans back and smiles a little. Manager. Um, your son? Looks at me. Um, you're in supply chain, right? Me. Yes. Yes, I am. Entitled mom. Yeah, he wants me to spend a bunch of money on my son's Xbox. My son even found a place for him to work on it. I was going to buy the thing he needs. He just has to install it. Manager to her. Would you excuse us for a second? I'd like to talk to OP. Entitled mom leaves looking smug. Manager to me. I'm at the same level as the manager as far as responsibilities. Um, can you tell me what's going on? I ping my counterpart, who was there for both interactions. As she's entering, Entitled Mom calls out, Make sure you tell him what really happened. Manager, I think I'm going to be really sorry, but what did happen? We explain, and my coworker is way more heated than I am. I also refer him to my friend who works near them for the rest of the story and to show him my friend's IMs. Manager, I'm so sorry. Do you want HR involved? Me. Only if she keeps asking me to do this stuff. Also, next time if I ask for a meeting with you, don't add someone to the invite. Don't surprise me. We talk a bit more before he leaves and he promises she'll only come to me if there's a work reason. Fast forward a month. She walks by my desk and says she's on her way to a meeting and says, Well, I just thought you should know we had to get our son a new PlayStation since you wouldn't help him with his Xbox. Me. You weren't willing to pay someone who would do it for 50 bucks, so you spent hundreds on something different, and this is my fault? Yeah, if you had just made the change, we wouldn't have had to. I'm speechless. She walked off looking smug, and I emailed her manager and HR and haven't had to interact since. Apparently, she reserved a meeting room in my area just so she could walk by my area to say that. Now, she's not allowed to come to our area and has to work through her manager for anything to do with us. She's also been warned not to badmouth me or she'll lose her job. Edit. Wow, thank you kind internet strangers. 
I'm glad there's a forum to share bizarre stories in. I've enjoyed reading everyone else's and I'm glad my story resonated. Something brought to my attention by a couple of commenters is the possibility that this lady wanted me. I had never considered that before and shudder now, but it makes odd sense. I just IM'd my friend from the story and he says she flirts a lot with people senior to her, often in very uncomfortable ways. Sad thing is that her husband is a successful person. It makes me wonder if he does the same thing. Shudders again. Have you ever had a coworker who kept bugging you to do things? If so, what did you do about it? Please let us know. I don't see why he couldn't have just done it for her. The nerve of some people. Entitled roommate has no idea I left. So I moved in with my coworker after working together for about three years. She's almost 60 and I'm 23 on the first of the month. I thought it was going to be calm and chill considering her age and how much of an introvert I am. Boy, was I completely wrong. I've never met anyone more entitled in my life and I have a lot of stories I could have posted here, but this one I just had to. Just a few things that have happened less than a month of me being here. 1. While I was at work, she sent me a message asking to borrow $100 to go out and have fun. She has borrowed money from me in the past and she gives it back in increments of 5s and 10s through a period of months. I told her I don't have $100 to just give to her and she said, what about 80? As if that makes it more doable. I told her no and she said if I trusted her, I would give her my bank card so she could go take out the money she wanted from the bank and then bring my card back. No. I told her money doesn't leave my bank unless I'm taking it out and she acted like I was only doing this so she couldn't go out and have a fun time. I lent her $12 that same morning for gas money. 2. A few hours after asking to borrow $100, she sent me another message telling me that I need to keep the curtains open always and make sure I tidy everything up before bed every night because that's how she likes her house. I told her that no, I will not be keeping the curtains open at night because it makes me feel unsafe and also asked her if there was a reason for her to be saying I need to keep things clean. She responded back telling me it's how she likes her curtains and to remember to keep them open during the day or before I ever leave the house. She also said there was no particular reason for her saying to keep things tidy. She was just telling me so I would know. I'm not a neat freak, but by no means have I ever left a mess for anyone else to find. I told her she was being ridiculous and she told me it wasn't ridiculous and it's not a big deal to just listen to what she was saying and that I was stressing her out. 3. The same day I was still at work, she told me she was going out anyway. Guess the $100 wasn't really essential, huh? And asked if I could bring her laundry up to her room for her. Mind you that this laundry is laundry that I did the night before and I folded all of her clothes and put them on the couch for her. She didn't work the night I did the laundry or the next day and she let it sit on the couch. I was in the middle of a 9 hour shift in the middle of a rush when she asked that. I did not respond. It was very hard to come back after work and see it sitting on the couch and not throw it all back into the dryer. 4. She's been gone for days now. No idea where she is. But last night after I got out of work, she sent me a message saying that this wasn't working out and she's going through too much in her life right now to have me adding to her stress. Denying her money, questioning her requests, asking if I'm a house guest or paying half the rent stresses her out. I agreed and told her that this is too stressful for both of us and that I would leave before the end of the month. She freaked out. She told me that I'm not allowed to just leave and have to give her a notice and pay a fee of $81.25 the exact amount she said, just for the inconvenience. I never even signed anything when I moved in. We didn't even have a verbal agreement. It hasn't even been a full month. I told her that half of the cable slash Wi-Fi bill, I got it for us, plus the $60 she owes me from one week alone should cover that mysterious fee. 5. The first week of me being there, she would walk in my room while I was sleeping, wake me up, and start talking about her day. Waking up to someone hovering over me is something that happened with a very bad ex numerous times and every time she would do that, I would be terrified and she knew I went through a situation like this. 6. If I left anything in the bathroom counter, she would move it to a drawer and tell me that my stuff needs to go into that drawer. 7. I left a brush on the table downstairs before leaving for work and I come back to find it laying on the ground outside my bedroom door. 8. I've come back to find all of my wine coolers gone numerous times because she runs out of beer and she will drink whatever I have in the fridge. 9. She hasn't taken out the trash not once out of all of the time I've been there. 10. She would repeatedly ask me why don't we talk anymore. She loved to vent about herself, then tells me she feels like she's walking on eggshells around me because I don't talk to her anymore. I like to be alone, 
especially after working eight hour shifts days in a row. 11. When I tried explaining how I felt to her, she would get extremely defensive and act like I was purposely trying to stress her out. She couldn't say how stressed out her life had been the past few months enough and anything I did that she didn't want me to was just so awful to her and I was out to get her. 12. When I would leave the house, it's rare but it happens, she would call me at least twice and send at least two messages within a two hour period. I felt like I was being suffocated and when I expressed this to her, she got really defensive and made me feel bad for saying anything at all. Not even a single month. Since she's been MIA for the past three days, the this isn't working out message happened last night, I started packing immediately after she sent that. It was almost like a saving grace. I've been debating on leaving since the second week and that sealed it for me and continued on in the morning. It took me all day, but I did it. And she still thinks I'm going to be there until the end of the month. She's going to walk into no cable slash Wi-Fi, the same movies she's had for years and a pile of laundry on the couch. She should feel lucky I left the dish soap, laundry detergent, paper towels, dish sponge, and two rolls of toilet paper because I've been buying all of that too. I took all the groceries I bought that I still wanted and my ice cube trays. My mom couldn't stop laughing because she was so shocked she was like this. She had no idea. And Wednesday, she's helping me set up my room again. Feels good to be home. Update. She left a voicemail telling me I was to come back today because it's my day off and grab the rest of my stuff. I left a box in the shed because it's locked and she has the key to it. It's VHS tapes and I will not come and go as I please. I'm not allowed there anymore and that I left the room an absolute mess and that she has to clean all day. I didn't want to hear her voice so I sent her a message and told her I would be going on Wednesday, not today, and technically still have a week left. I also told her I hope she didn't do anything to that room because I did in fact take a full blown video of the room before I left that has the date. Her landlord is giving me back the security deposit on Wednesday and that's why I'm going on Wednesday. She replied and said it was really wrong of me to decide to leave and I don't have a choice. I come today or Wednesday, that's final. So decide right now and that I'll learn as I get older that it's going to be so tough for me. I told her that I already said I'm going Wednesday, that I left because she said it wasn't working and I agreed. And why would I stay if we're both so uncomfortable? I told her a lot of things she did were so wrong, but I wasn't about to spend my day off arguing with her, so have a nice day. Bye bye. She says bye bye to me whenever she sends a condescending message. Then I put her on ignore again. She won't be there Wednesday, but I'll make an update about what happens when I go. Update 2. A mutual coworker of ours called me. We used to all work together at a different job and told me that she has been blowing her up and calling her multiple times in a row since I left to vent about how awful and how horrible of a person slash roommate I am. The lies she is saying are outrageous and I can't imagine all the people she must be calling and will continue to call until the wee hours of the morning. She calls people whenever she feels like it. And from what she said to her, I believe that she has trashed my room. Good thing I have the video to try and make it so I don't get the deposit. I sent all the screenshots of what she's been messaging me to her. Some of them contradict what she told her and she was laughing at the blatant lying she was doing. She also made it out to sound like I wasn't paying rent and just staying there free. And it turns out whenever I didn't answer one of her messages while I was at work or just in general, she would call her and yell about how disrespectful and rude I was and how done she is with me and what nerve I have to be living in her house and to not respond or listen to her. And apparently, she absolutely lost it on the phone about the curtain thing when I said no, but she didn't mention asking to borrow $100 or to take my bank card. The real kicker is that ex-roommate owes her $40. I am not ready for work tomorrow. Have you ever had a roommate that you just couldn't stand? If so, what did you do about it? Please let us know. Sounds like she needs to speak to her manager. Karen demands I load her dresser because I'm parked next to her. So today I'm at Costco getting my meds, minding my own business. A lady and her son bought one of the dressers that Costco is selling. Fine, all good. They actually look pretty good. Mom decides the two of them can get in the car and refuse to help despite the two of them basically being the living embodiment of sticks. I mean, anything's possible, right? We all made it out through the queue to get outside and they're about eight to 10 steps behind me. Mom and son are bickering because son knows she's not strong enough to lift aside. Mom won't have it. I get closer to my car only to find a young family struggling with a two-year-old refusing to go in its seat. Inconvenient given it's 95 degrees before the heat reflecting properties of asphalt, but whatever, I'm not in a rush. Kids will be the monsters they will be. Mom and son try to lift the dresser to no dice and to my immense humor. 
I've had to deal with her at work before, and she isn't the nicest person. Sadly, she recognizes me at some point and demands I get over here and help my son load this. I pretended not to hear her and went about watching the kid just mess around with his dad trying to buckle him in. 10 for 10 would watch again with popcorn. Mom decides to tap my shoulder to get my attention. Q, help my son load this dresser. Again, no, as my answer isn't taken well and she had a freak out moment. Even so far to threaten to return the tree she bought from us because I was being rude. Good luck with that lady. You and your son can't lift a 150 pound dresser. Good luck lifting that 800 pound autumn blaze maple now that it's had plenty of time to root in. I finally look at the son and see his obvious shame that his mom is acting like a two year old not wanting to go into the car seat. I agree to help the kid, so long as mom doesn't touch it because she will tip the box too much. Gotta keep in mind, I'm 6 foot 2 with a 6 foot 6 wingspan, I know, long arms, and a bit of a brute from shifting many 300 to 700 pound trees by hand. We lift the dresser into the truck bed without too much issue, despite the fact I took about all the weight. Mom then decided I need to follow them home to help offload the dresser. Heck no, lady. Heck no. It was big enough of an r slash I don't work here lady moment to even load the thing, let alone ending up back at your house to offload it. The dad finally managed to get the baby buckled up and I hopped in my car and drove off. Ended up that she called my job to complain that I was rude and not helpful. Sales staff know I'm off on Mondays my only day off after all, and ask what it was about. Lady I guess decided to admit that she was trying to bully me into helping her and it got laughed off. Can't wait to see what comes of this. Cheers mad lads and mad lasses dealing with r slash I don't work here lady issues. Edit 1. I'm aware I shouldn't have caved and helped her, but at the time it seemed like a good thing to help the kid with her. I have one of these entitled jerks as a stepmother. Kind of hard for me not to sympathize. I'll take the free mini vacation for zero dollars, Alex. A little background. I took a position within my company that required a cross-country relocation from the west coast to the east coast along with a change in corporate divisions. I knew as part of this deal I'd have to return to the west coast once or twice a year, a total of maybe six to eight days a year, to handle some integration things. So I packed up, left family and friends, and get happily settled in at the new job. A few months go by before the topic of a return trip to the west coast pops up in a meeting. The guy that organizes our release schedules has pulled some dates out of nowhere for the trip. It's a Monday to Thursday. We coordinate with the customer and carve all this into granite. Let me take a quick detour here. The guy who maintains our schedule is Dean. Dean is paid a pricely sum to maintain an MS project schedule and do a couple other simple things. Dean doesn't seem willing to use the MS project features that allows you to import holidays into your schedules, so he once picked some arbitrary dates for a couple hardware techs to do work over what turned out to be Thanksgiving. It happens that this division of Mondo Corp doesn't pay us to travel on weekends and Dean has me meeting the customer on Monday morning. I bring it up on our next staff meeting to confirm that, indeed, unlike my old division, they won't pay for weekend travel. My manager says, nope, no pay for weekend travel. I'm not happy I have to donate half a day on Sunday to the company. I have a little epiphany. I ask if Friday travel is authorized. My manager says, sure, why not? I ask again. I can fly back to the West Coast on Friday morning, get a rental car, stay three extra nights, and Mondo Corp will pay? The answer is still yes. I spent the weekend revisiting my favorite eating haunts, visiting family, visiting friends, and in general having a good time, all paid for by Mondo Corp. I get to work Monday morning with a nice tan and a bit of a hangover. Epilogue Dean stopped scheduling things for Monday mornings. He now prefers we meet with customers on Tuesdays. Entitled lady won't pay me for cleaning her house. I've started cleaning an old lady's house for her a few times a week since she has a bad back and can't do very many things herself. She was very nice at first, showing me how to operate her very old vacuum, where everything is, etc. The first time cleaning her house took two hours. She paid me $50 and I was a happy teen. Well, after a few times, I got faster at cleaning. I'm able to finish cleaning in under an hour now. This is when entitled lady thinks that she can mess with me a little. I finished cleaning her house in about 45 minutes. This is the conversation. Me, I'm done cleaning for today, entitled lady. Oh, good, you can call your mom to pick you up now. Me, uh, may I please have my pay for today? You finished under one hour, so you don't get the money. Me, I don't think that's how it works. Entitled lady getting a little annoyed. Well, maybe next time you should take your time cleaning. Me, okay, I can do that next time, but may I please have my money for today? No, now leave my house before I call the police for trespassing. 
I was completely shocked by what she said and I left her house. I stood outside and called my mother to pick me up. When she got there, I told her what Entitled Lady had told me. My mother was furious. She ran up to the house and banged on the door. Entitled Lady opens the door and the conversation occurs. Entitled Lady, snarky attitude. Can I help you? Mom, already angry. Why didn't you pay my daughter? She didn't work for an hour, so I don't have to pay her. She cleaned your house for you. Now give me her pay. Now. No. Leave my property now or I'll call the police. Forget you. My mother walked back over to the car and gave me some money from her wallet. Mom, here, you can at least have the money you earned. We left her property and got home. My mother was still furious about Entitled Lady and started yelling outside. Entitled Lady is our neighbor. Entitled Lady started yelling back at my mother. My mother yelled that I wouldn't be coming back to clean anytime soon. Entitled Lady didn't respond and my mother felt better then. This is only part one. Part two will be posted later. Sorry for any spelling errors, I'm on my cell phone and thank you so much for reading. Entitled Family Buys Their First Fish Tank So I've taken up fish keeping as a hobby and let me just tell you, those little guys are a lot of work. I'm in my local pet shop at least once every other week, to the point that they've gotten to know me pretty well. It's a chain store, but the staff at this place is really excellent and I cannot heap enough praise upon them. They do a really good job of making sure to have at least one decently knowledgeable person there working in every section. Anyway, the other day I popped in to grab some fish food and since I had room, maybe a couple of fish if they had anything interesting. It was semi busy and the fish section guy was busy helping a family of two parents and one very rambunctious girl who was running back and forth through the fish aisle. Every once in a while, the girl stopped to stare at one of the tanks and points out a fish she liked. Mommy's cooing, wow, without looking up from the phone. Meanwhile, dad came back over with a 15 gallon tank, which is relatively small for a tank, and basically all of the equipment, decorations, you name it. Everything you'd need to get started. Okay, sweetie, he said, ready to pick out some fishies? This stopped the fish guy in his tracks. Uh, are those fish for that tank you're buying? Dad enthusiastically replied, Yep, it's our first fish tank. Okay, so I wouldn't expect this to be universal knowledge, but it is important to know if you plan on getting fish. It's a really bad idea to set up a fish tank and put the fish in on the same day. It's even worse if you put many fish in it simultaneously, because you need to give the tank time to settle first. Depending on the source, the water may have to be treated, as most species of fish are somewhat particular in the water conditions they can handle and if you were including things like life plans, you need to give them time to make the changes to the water that they inevitably make. Otherwise, the stress and shock from unsuitable conditions or a rapid change in water quality can hurt the fish quite quickly. For a more scientific explanation of all this, look up aquarium cycling. Anyway, the fish guy politely explained this to the family and said that it's typically the store policy to not sell fish and a tank to customers on the same day. The tank should take about a week or two to cycle, and if there are any fish that they really want, they can buy them in advance and the store will hold them in a special tank until they're ready to be picked up. The little girl piped up with, Daddy, when can I get my fishy? And this guy went straight to, I'm sorry, sweetheart. This man is saying you can't have a fishy right now. Immediately, this girl ran about six feet back, slammed her back up against the fish tanks, slid to the door, and started sobbing. Mommy rushed to the girl and immediately started with, Don't worry, Daddy will get your fishy. Fish guy didn't really know how to handle this at this point, but lucky him that the manager was just happening to walk by. Is everything okay here? He asked. Dad replied with, Yeah, this guy won't sell us a fish. The manager then asked, Is it for that tank you're holding, sir? Dad said, Yes. And the manager began to give him the same exact explanation as the fish guy before. Dad cut in with, Yeah, I heard that spiel. Don't care. The manager was trying to reiterate why it is such a bad idea to do this, and the dad finally said, Like I said, I don't care. You see that girl right there? I am more than happy to let that go on all day until you sell me some fish. The manager sighed, looked at the fish guy and said, Just give him the dang fish, and walked away for what I can only imagine was the most important cigarette of the day. The dad stood there looking all smug and announced, Okay, sweetie, you can get your fish. And it was like a switch got flicked and the girl stopped immediately, like she had never had a tantrum in her life. 
As if it were not enough for them to get their way, this family proceeded to pick out a fish from virtually every tank. I wish I were joking. Without thinking twice, these people put together an abomination of a tank. You see, there are many kinds of fish. Some are big, some are small, some are solitary, and some hang out in groups. Some like to nibble on store-bought flakes, and some delight in tearing the next nearest fish into fresh flakes. These are the things you must consider when stocking a tank with fish. These people did not consider that. Remotely. I'm talking like single specimens of fish that should be in a group. Some larger fish like goldfish, which honestly need like 10 gallons apiece. Some catfish that are almost certainly not going to eat flakes from the surface. Basically, a whole bunch of fish that should not be together and not crammed into 15 gallons of water. But friends, there is at least some assurance that these people will have a learning experience. You see, the very last fish they grabbed was what the father called the biggest goldfish I've ever seen. Fish guy tried to explain, but by that point they had completely tuned him out. Look, his name is Oscar, like Oscar the Grouch. Heh, <laughs> Grouch, that's putting it lightly. Because you see, Oscar was not a goldfish. Oscar was an Oscar, a type of cichlid. They are territorial as heck, and this guy was destined for a 15 gallon tank of many much smaller fish. So they went off to pay. They left a decent number of zebrafish, so I ended up asking for those. I told the guy, and don't worry, my tank cycled and is well established. He just put his head down and said, those idiots. I replied, I feel bad for the fish though. He said that when they inevitably come back for a refund, they'll have a hard time with it when the receipt shows both the tank and the fish. Anyway, if Oscar survived the water conditions, I'm sure they're having a National Geographic moment right now. I'll try to remember to follow up if the same guy is working next time I go in. He's there frequently, so am I. I should probably learn his name. I'm bad with that kind of stuff. I got Karen fired from the HOA. To start the story, some background you need to know about me. I volunteer to train and raise service dogs. My fiance says clearly I have a look that says I am weak and a pushover. I have constant encounters with Karens who are just not ready for my responses when they engage me. I have been in the military for 17 years when this happened and was responsible for managing over 130 service members I am anything but a pushover. I work with civilians so I have cultivated a polite exterior but I was counseled for looking unapproachable and scary to civilian counterparts. The story. As I said, I raise service animals, so I fall under the ADA when it comes to regulations on where and what I can do with my puppy. We'll call him O. O is an amazingly behaved black lab of six months. I have cultivated a level of trust and obedience where I can leave him in a sit with other dogs around so long as I am in eyesight and he will stay. I'd raised a few pups by then and I would never have done that with them, but O is amazing and I can't wait to get him back after his tour of duty helping Mrs. C be independent. I meet the HOA Karen one Saturday. Me and my fiance and O were going to head on a road trip to visit my fiance's parents. In our preparation, the last on the list is always getting the kids to use the bathroom before a long trip. So we head out. O gets busy and I grab a bag to clean it up. I put him in a sit stay and hand the leash to my girl. As I start walking to the trash can, it's about 100 feet from where he went, I have a clear line of sight to the dog and he's sitting pretty and alert and watching me intently for a hand cue or a voice command. As I'm walking, I hear a woman start screeching. I don't quite make it out, but it sounds angry. I ignore it and keep walking to the dumpster to deposit my waste bag and turn around to head back to my two favorite people. It is then I make eye contact with the HOA Karen, Karen from here on out. She's your typical Karen, not an inch over five foot and has the same circumference, the short chopped hair that says I'm the manager now. She looks me in the eyes and I finally listen to her shrill scream of your dog must be on a leash and in your hand. My county state law says so. I will call the cops. Now, I don't do ignorant, and respect given is respect earned. I was willing to try and de-escalate. My fiancé owns the condo and is super non-confrontational. So for her, I try to bring it back down to civil levels of discussion. In a polite but firm voice, I asked, Did she even look over at the dog before she started yelling at me? She just bellows like a banshee again. I repeat, this back and forth happens three or four times, me calm, her escalating in pitch and volume. At this point, she hasn't given respect, so none is required to be given back. 
I break out my, you done messed up, NCO to junior voice, it is loud, and clearly states, I'm done with your BS, lady. I clearly tell her if she would have taken two seconds to look, she would have seen the dog is sitting on a leash in someone's hands. She stops bellowing at me, looks, and turns a bit red in the face and musters, you could just say thank you, which I curtly reply, shut up and get out of my face. She waddled quickly off, tail tucked into her conto door. My next meeting with her was when I was grilling. The HOA states no charcoal grills and no smoking slash barbecue. I was born in the north, but as a military brat, moved to the south since I was two. There's a difference between barbecuing and grilling. Barbecue is 12 plus hours with coals of hardwood or wood smoking. Grilling is cooking meat on a grill instead of the stove. The HOA put out a reminder, no barbecuing on the premises and no coals. So I was like, awesome, get a small propane grill. It's not barbecue, but it's better than nothing. So I was out grilling and I hear the banshee cry all too familiar now. Again, she didn't come up to me and talk. She just started screaming. So I looked her right in the eye and with the same firm voice, shut up and go away. If you say one more word, I'll be the one calling the cops for harassment by an HOA member. She sputtered something about no grilling or open flames and I told her buzz off, show me in writing and by someone other than her. She waddled off and then I was approached by the HOA president with the HOA bylaws and sat to read them. During which my fiance started a conversation with them about another issue we were having with them. She was in the middle of having the state attorney's office ask some questions about activities they were trying to force her into paying for. It wasn't going well for the HOA and she took this opportunity to introduce herself. While she may be non-confrontational when it comes to small things, she will stand up for herself when it comes to it. Her introducing herself changed everyone's tone and they became oh so polite. Karen tried to play the victim to her and say I was mean and could use some manners when engaging with people. I love my soon-to-be wife, so let her paint her tale how she was a victim. When she finished, she looked her dead in the eyes and said, you know, I was the one holding the leash and I was standing right here when he was grilling. So no, you got the same respect you gave. She paled and faded to the back. And that's when the president of the HOA stepped in and told me I can't have the grill and that I can be fined and I needed to follow the rules of the HOA or the next time he'll be the one calling the cops. Well, president, roger that. It is my job to enforce regulations in the military. I spend hours reading instructions. Nothing pleases me more than when I get to shove it in someone's face at work to my guys what they are owed or to force them to do their job right. So you want me to follow the rules? Copy that, buddy. So I begin my research. I found a few interesting things. 1. No HOA bylaw can be enforced if it is not the state database. 2. This particular HOA's bylaws were last updated 1994. It was 2016. 3. They state they follow my county's fire code, which follows NFPA. 4. Finally, the gym. The exact coordinates of the HOA's property lines. So I get a login for the state's database and print the HOA bylaws. I print the NFPA, which states in a multifamily home, you can store propane tanks no bigger than 2.7 liters, but they can total no more than 5.4 liters cumulatively. I go to Lowe's, get a rope tape measure and stakes. I pull up Google Maps and mark the HOA boundary line on it. Lo and behold, what do I find? A drainage ditch that is city property not 10 feet from where I was grilling. So I take my coordinates, my stakes, and go carefully mark off the section of city property. Now for the revenge. I call the city slash county fire departments and request a permit to grill on said city property. They said go for it. I didn't need a permit for it and no one would care. I insisted and they said it's my 50 bucks. They issued an event open flame. So with both permits, it was 100 bucks, but I got permission from the city to grill there for six months. The next day at 7 a.m. I went to set up. I carefully measured so I was at least three feet into the city property set up my cooler with enough meat and beer to grill till doomsday, then waited for the fireworks. It didn't take long for Karen to come screaming at me. I mean, it was 10 feet from the community pool and 3 feet from the sidewalk gazebo that led to the pool. I just hit record on my phone and politely told her she has no need to yell and I am breaking no laws. She kept screaming about no grilling and how she's tired of me and she's going to get me arrested and kicked out if it's the last thing she does. She hasn't liked me since she saw me and has just been waiting to get me kicked out. Then now that she knows which condo is mine, it's just a matter of time till she finds something. On and on. 
I guess me polite and showing zero fear was upsetting her and she tried to come to take my stuff. Big no-no. As she reached for my cooler, I broke out my NCO voice and told her if she so much as brushes a finger against my property, I would remove the offending body part with force if necessary. This sent her scurrying off again. About 20 minutes later, I see two cop cars pull up and Mr. HOA president himself. He's all chummy with the cops and as they approach, I hear him say, yep, same guy. I already told him once before he can't grill on the HOA grounds. He comes to a stop about 10 feet from me. One cop stays with him and the other keeps walking up to me. I have a crap eating grin on my face. I can hardly wait for the conversation to happen. The cop is slightly off put by my joyous face and slight giggle when I ask what seems to be the problem officer. I get informed that I am in violation of the bylaws and have been warned once already and I am going to receive a ticket for disturbing the peace for threatening the HOA when they were trying to enforce their rules, ticket for an illegal open flame, ticket for illegal storage of flammable substance, on and on. The last was, if I didn't pick up, I would be arrested and removed. Now that he was done, I first handed him my permit from the city to grill. He took it, walked back to the president, and they discussed it for a moment and then returned. Says you can't get a permit from the city to grill on private property. I then showed him the coordinates for the HOA and the Google Maps gridded drawing and my current GPS location. Mind you, I'm smiling handing the sheet to him because the grid was not all on one sheet and had addendums. It took about four minutes to explain it to him. As I was about to hand him more, he held up a hand to stop me. He then asks how long I had planned this with a smirk. I told him, oh, about a week. He gave me a look of disbelief but moved on. He then asked me if I threatened Karen. I just played back the recording to him. At the end, he said nothing seems out of place here, you are free to go. I stopped him and asked if I could file a complaint for HOA harassment through him. He said no, that the city clerk office is the correct place, but he would document harassment by the two of them and file a report for me. In my state, it's illegal to be harassed by the HOA. It comes with jail of a few months, fines as high as $5,000 and immediate removal from the board and the possibility of recovery of damages. I settled for them both being removed from the board instead of filing a complaint. I waved to Karen every day I grill or showed her my leash if I had O. Oh. Have you ever had a problem with the HOA? If so, what did you do about it? Please let us know. My only problem is they won't let me join the board. Am I the jerk for walking out of my house in shock over my wife's priorities? Would just like to preface this by saying I, 37, male, walked out not in malicious protest, but because I wanted to cool off. So here goes. My wife, who's 38, and daughter, who is 11, got into a jokey discussion about alien invasions and apocalyptic situations. Then my daughter asks if my wife would protect her in this situation, and my wife says, I love you more than I'll love anybody else in the world. Yes, she says this in front of me. My wife then puts her arm around my shoulder and goes on to say that her father, aka me, and I would use each other as shields against any danger that comes to you, meaning she'd gladly sacrifice me. At that point, I picked up my keys and said, gee, thanks, go ahead and start lunch without me. My wife suddenly gets self-righteous and said there was no way I could expect her to choose a spouse over her kid. I felt like she had just crapped on our entire marriage and life vows, and the principle aside, the fact I was furious I think should have been enough to excuse me leaving the house, so I left the house and drove around to cool off. Then I went over to my sister's house because I told her how upset I was, and as a result, she and her spouse invited me over to have dinner with them. I may have ignored some calls from my wife, but she knew where I was, and in addition, I just couldn't see her or be in the house at the moment. I always felt like my wife loved the kids more than me, and it hurts. The fact that she would hypothetically and so casually throw me to the wolves was making me question if I loved her more than she loved me, and if so, why I bothered to give her my loyalty. When there could be other women, like my sister, who valued their spouses more than anything. Am I the jerk? Not for my beliefs, but for the fact that I took the time to cool off. I needed this time because I was seriously and suddenly regretting a lot of the sacrifices I made for her when it wasn't like I didn't have other options. Women in their early 20s who have hit on me but who I ignored in favor of the woman who I thought would put me first. Well, what do you think? Do you think OP overreacted or was he right? Please let us know. Bruh. Manager gets me fired 
I'd turn around and get her job. I was hired by a company as an assistant manager, a job I was well qualified for. The owner is rarely on site as he owns several businesses. The company is run by a GM who hired me but who mostly works second shift and who I therefore would have little daily contact with since I was hired for first shift. I was assigned to Eva for training. Eva was a manager and had been with the company five years. I trained with her for a few days and then I was on my own, though she and I had overlapping shifts and would see each other a few days a week. We were friendly but not close. After a few months, I was doing well at my job and had even gotten some new procedures adopted to help boost sales. Eva began to act resentful. She would correct me for small things and took any opportunity to remind me that she had trained me. It didn't matter to me. She wasn't my boss. I reported to the GM, so I mostly just ignored her. What I didn't know was that Eva was not just tight with the GM, but they had worked together at another place for 10 years before this one. One day at shift end, GM asks to talk, tells me it's not working out, says I'm still making mistakes at six months that I shouldn't be. I ask for examples. A few of them were petty matters Eva had mentioned, but most of them were just not true. I tried to argue, but it was clear that I was set up. I decided to reach out to the owner since I had nothing to lose. He was sympathetic, but said he relies on GM to run the business and had to support her decision. Then he mentioned that if things hadn't been so bad between me and Eva, it probably could have been worked out. That's when I knew she was behind me being fired from a job I needed, really liked, and was making great money at, and I vowed to get revenge. I started searching her info online. In less than an hour, I had uncovered gold thanks to one of those pay services. About three months prior, Eva was arrested and charged with a DWI in a neighboring state. The court records showed she had a hearing coming up in a few weeks. That was enough to get her fired. It affects the professional license she and I had to have as management. Per state law, license holders must report criminal charges to the licensing board, and in the case of a DWI arrest, licenses are typically suspended pending trial. I called the owner and told him what I discovered. It was news to him. I guess since it was out of state, Eva was keeping it secret. Maybe she was hoping to get let off the charges. The next day, the owner called and said Eva was fired. He thanked me for telling him about her DWI, apologized for how I was fired, and offered me Eva's position and salary. He asked me to come in the next morning to meet with him and to cover Eva's shift. I accepted. That alone was sweetly satisfying revenge, but what happened next was the icing on the cake. I got to work extra early, met with the owner and GM, and we all agreed to start fresh. Cool. It was still an hour before opening, and I was in the back of the place when I heard the front door chime. When I came out a few minutes later, Eva was there, tears flowing, begging the owner for her job back. She obviously didn't know I was there, because when she saw me, her whole body seized and her shocked expression was priceless. I walked right by her, staring her down with a crap-eating grin, and went outside. Eva came out a minute later and wouldn't make eye contact. As she walked away, I said, good luck on the 23rd. That was her court date. Have you ever gotten revenge on a coworker? If so, we'd really love to hear about it. Effective immediately. About 10 months ago, I worked dispatch and transport for a company who was in the steel reinforcement industry. I generally worked with customers to have their steel arrive when they needed it so they wouldn't be delayed as best I could and occasionally would have to ask other customers if they could reschedule or if their delivery was time critical. My original supervisor had left for a better opportunity at a rival company about five months prior and I now had to report to the higher ups because they refused to either promote me or hire someone to fill his position and instead just transferred someone from interstate who was from another department not transport, to do the easier parts of my job, calling customers who had multi-level buildings to pre-plan an approximate date of when they would need certain work plans put into production. While I had to continue to do the bulk of delivery planning, truck scheduling, driver manifests, and booking any small courier work. Although, during the week leading up to this MC, she was on leave and I had been doing everything. Now, rule of thumb was account customers who paid a premium delivery got priority, then standard account customers, followed by one-off or cash sale customers, unless the customer happened to pay for the premium delivery service. Unfortunately, sales and management had started getting the idea that they could get every delivery done whenever the customer said jump, because I had been hitting the target with about a 99% hit rate, with the exceptions of when weather or machine breakdown became a factor. 
Sorry for the backstory, but I feel it was needed to get the full context of the job. Those in transport understand. So I got a call from one of the customers, we'll call him John Doe, who happened to be a cash sale, telling me he needed his steel on this site approximately 80 kilometers away. 50 miles for those who not yet caught up with the rest of the world. At 7 a.m. on Monday on a truck with a crane but couldn't accommodate a semi as there wasn't room on the site. Problem was that this was on Friday in the afternoon, 90 minutes before my finishing time. I told the customer I'm sorry but there's no way I could get 23 tons of steel produced and delivered to him by 7 a.m. as his site was at least 60 to 90 minutes away depending on traffic and our crane truck drivers start at 6 a.m. So they first need to check and tie down their load before getting the okay to leave by the safety officer on site. But also, all our production capacity was full and his steel, which was originally booked for Tuesday afternoon, was pre-approved for a semi with no crane as they had one on site. Now the silence was deafening as I knew exactly what was coming. JD had started a huge tirade about how his steel needed to be there or he'd missed the concrete pour and his steel fixers needed it ready to go the moment they finished their site meeting. I guess they had an hour long site meeting and that their crane was not arriving on site until the following week when the prefab walls arrive. Now to be fair, I had just had a week of heck already and this guy was the last thing I wanted before I was to enjoy my weekend so I simply responded with the, I'm sorry sir but my hands are tied at this point. If you had called yesterday and I had time to try and rearrange some jobs, it would have had a slight chance of being pushed up, but as it is now, I wouldn't be able to. A. Have this deal produced, or B. Have two crane trucks spare to dedicate to one delivery. Before he can resume his rant, I tell the customer, I can try for Tuesday morning, but again, at this point, only half of the order would get there, and I would first need to have a driver agree to start early to be there by 7 a.m. JD. That's not good enough. I've paid good money for this deal, so I expect it when I need it. Me, I understand you need this deal. However, you're asking me to prioritize your work over another that was already booked and confirmed. JD, and your point? Just get me my delivery. Me, my point is, you're asking me to sit here at my desk for another two hours while I attempt to find the trucks needed from outside hire departments. Ask the production team to work overtime tonight and tomorrow to complete the extra work loading onto two separate trucks and try to convince two drivers to start at least half an hour earlier to have a chance at being there by 7 a.m. if they are quick at tying down their loads, as well as the extra work the morning crew will have on Monday to load two other trucks that couldn't get preloaded as they're outside hire and won't get there until 6 a.m. at the earliest. And that's assuming I can even find the trucks on such short notice considering most companies have their trucks completely booked out by midday for the next business day. JD Forget you. Don't tell me how you can't do it. Last week I ordered 50 lengths and it was here 3 hours later. So don't tell me you can't do it. Me May I ask who you ordered it through? We have a few sites around the state that hold stock materials that can be couriered and assumed correctly that this is what had happened. JD Dave is the guy I normally speak to about that stuff. Me. Oh, from our site that is literally 20 minutes from you that had the stock on hand, so only needed to put it on a truck that was going that way? Apparently, this is where I had pushed him over the edge because he hung up on me and I had wrongly assumed he got the message that he was asking the impossible and conceded. But no, I got a call from the big boss asking me to come up to his office about 10 minutes later. When I got there, the sales manager was there also. Boss, what's this I'm told you refused a customer their delivery? Before I can respond, sales manager, I just got off the phone with a customer who I was about to put on an account, telling me that you were rude and offensive and he expects his delivery. Me, hmm, okay. So in answer to your question, boss, yes, I have refused a customer their delivery on the grounds that we can't make that time slot as we're already booked up until Tuesday afternoon. And no sales manager, I wasn't rude or offensive but if he took offense to anything I said, then that's on him, as offense is taken, not given. Boss. Okay, why can't we make that delivery? Me. Well, because the 23 tons of steel he ordered was originally confirmed for Tuesday afternoon on a semi with no crane, as they apparently had a crane on the site. However, he asked for it to be Monday morning at 7 a.m., split onto two rigid crane trucks only 25 minutes ago. Thinking this was a satisfactory answer, I had assumed they would have realized what a jerk this guy was. Sales manager. What do you mean? That's no reason we can't get the steel to him. 
At this point, I had lost my patience as the sales team seemed to think they could get their way no matter what because management always backed them. I don't know if it's like that in other countries, but here in Australia, we have two ways of reacting once we lose our patience, get angry or become a downright smarty. I chose the second path, me. Apart from the fact we have 280 tons of steel already booked for other customers, all our crane trucks are booked to confirmed slots and I would have a better chance of meeting the Queen of England at a local pub while Ozzy Osbourne was biting the head off of a bat than getting another two trucks booked before I finish. Boss, there's no need for that, but surely we can resolve this so everyone is happy. Sales manager, get the steel to the customer and I'll be happy. Me, stop thinking that I have a magic truck spawning wand that I wave every time you guys place an urgent order or a customer rings complaining they can't change the date and time of their delivery and I'll be a little less annoyed. This is where things went south. Boss. Well, this is a potential account customer, so here's what needs to happen. You will find a way to get this done or you will find another job, effective immediately. Me. Well, looks like I'm finding another job because there is no way I can get two trucks from here to site by 7 a.m. Monday morning and keep my other job deadlines that I have already confirmed. I then stood up and walked out of the office, back to the dispatch office where my desk was, wiped my personal files, my own notes and spreadsheets I kept that helped me in my job, from the computer I worked on, shut my computer down, and collected my personal belongings from the tea room and desk drawers. The guy who also worked in the office, he worked as the driver's safety check and made sure the trucks were always maintained and compliant. Maintenance guy asked what was going on, to which I shrugged and responded, me. You know that Clyde North guy from before? He just complained to his sales rep, who in turn complained to Big Boss, and they told me to find a way of getting it done or find another job. So I guess I'm finding another job. Maintenance guy. Yeah, but you haven't printed any of the manifest or done the courier booking for Monday morning. Me. I'm just following instructions and finding another job effective immediately, because they did tell me to do that if I didn't find a way. The desk phone rang, but I didn't answer because it was a sales manager. Then it rang again, this time Big Boss, but I still didn't answer because as far as I was concerned, I was now fired effective immediately. My mobile rang next from a number I didn't recognize, but I answered because of my karate school and being a potential new student. However, it was Big Boss on his personal mobile. Boss, why didn't you answer your desk phone? Me, oh, because effective immediately were the words used. Hence, I no longer work here and am not obligated to answer the phone at the desk I no longer am employed to sit at. Thank you for the employment, boss. By the way, you may need to send someone to organize the manifests and courier bookings for Monday as I normally do that in my last 90 minutes to ensure any cancellations are caught before I leave. And good luck finding a way of delivering that steel to Clyde North at 7 a.m. on Monday morning. I hung up the phone and said my goodbyes to a few people I actually liked and got along with on my way out. However, as I finished putting my things in my car, I had the sales manager and big boss stop me at my car telling me I had to finish out the day, to which I smiled and responded. Effective immediately are words I am happy to comply with. Got in my car and drove to my dojo where thanks to my leave payout, I can now run full-time karate and kabuto classes. As far as I was told, they had to pay a stupid amount of money to the competitor to help them cover the various deliveries that had to be moved around to accommodate the jerk that wouldn't accept his original agreement. Clyde North is the suburb of the delivery. Am I the jerk for not feeding my niece enough? The other day, my brother asked me if it was possible that I could babysit my niece because he and my parents were going to view a house. I agreed to look after her and he dropped my niece off while picking up my parents. My niece is three, she's adorable and a very curious compassionate kid. I absolutely adore her, but to put it nicely, she's a big girl for her age. Nothing wrong with a bit of puppy fat, but this was more than that. My brother and her mother have a habit of giving her anything she wants, things like chocolate and junk food just to stop her from crying and throwing a tantrum. My mother has addressed this issue with them before, saying that they are installing bad habits into her and that she has started giving her entitlement issues. They ignored my mother's warnings and I can definitely see what my mother is talking about regarding her getting entitled. Although I do agree with my mother, they can raise her how they like. While she was in my care, she started demanding chocolate and other things. When I told her no, that she needs to have her lunch first, she started to throw a fit screaming, crying, and rolling around, pounding her hands and feet on the floor. To get her to stop, I said, good girls get treats. Are you behaving like a good girl? She stopped and didn't say anything. 
I said that if she behaved herself, she would get a treat as a reward. After that, she was pretty well behaved. I gave her lunch, a tuna sandwich with some cut carrots and juice. She didn't want to eat the carrots, so I convinced her to eat them by reminding her that she would get a treat. She ate them, no problems, and I rewarded her with a child-sized bag of chocolate buttons. Everything was fine, no tantrums, no demanding more food, all was good. About four hours later, my brother returned and my niece ran over to him. She was happy and he asked if she had a good day. She said she did, telling him everything we did together. Then she said she was hungry. My brother asked what she ate and she told him saying she was still hungry, mentioning that about the rewards for good behavior. He got annoyed and asked if that was what really happened and I said it was, but didn't see the big deal. He took me outside and started screaming at me about not feeding his daughter enough, that she's a growing girl and that I was irresponsible. I said that I stopped her from throwing a tantrum for not getting what she wanted and as her caretaker, I did what I believed was the right thing to do, reminding him that I did give her lunch. He called me a jerk and said that I should never have kids because I clearly have no idea how to take care of them. He said that I barely fed her and that I should feel ashamed. I don't think I was a jerk at all. I gave her lunch and she never said anything to me about being hungry. If she did, I would have given her a sensible snack. Am I the jerk? Edit. Just to be clear, I'm not annoyed at my niece. She's three. I mean seriously, she's a kid after all. How can I be mad at a kid who will bandage your head if she accidentally taps you? Edit 2. I have read comments mentioning following their guidelines or asking if they gave me instructions. They didn't give me any. All my brother said was that she had had her breakfast, so I just needed to give her lunch. He's a great father to my niece, so you all know. I had her for about 5 hours. Edit 3. My niece isn't dumb. She saw my mother with junk food and knows where it is kept. It's too high for her to reach. What do you think? Did Opie do anything wrong or not? Please let us know. You think you can steal $1,200 worth of groceries? Think again. So, I work at a reasonably large grocery store. I'm a manager from the front end and have a pretty good eye for people stealing. Most of the time though, they make it extremely obvious. Well, I'm up at my computer filling stuff out, which just happens to face the front door. Now, there are two doors to the store. One is used primarily for entering, while the other is used primarily for exiting. There are no signs anywhere, it's just how people have collectively decided to do things. I look up and see a lady with a full cart of food walking out the entrance door, with everything loose and not in bags. Obviously, she's stealing. Because we can't just claim people are stealing, I immediately run to the back to look at the cameras. I see her walk to the bathroom, then immediately leave the store. So I run. I see her standing a few stores down from work and sprint over there. As I sprint, a car drives up and she starts unloading. Here's the conversation. We've got me, we've got the thief and the driver. Me. Hello ma'am, I'm sorry, but you took this cart pretty far from the store and I noticed you didn't have anything bagged. Is it okay if I ask to see a receipt for your transaction? Thief. Oh, my sister has the receipt. I'm just loading things up to my Uber. Me. Well, I will need to see a receipt. Otherwise, I'll have to call this in to the police. Thief. Well then, I'll call my sister to come back and show the receipt. Until then, I have to go. Me. Ma'am, I saw you on camera, and I didn't see you shopping with anyone. So if anyone has the receipt, it's you. You can't stop me from shopping. I bought these, okay? Continues loading items into the car. Me. Look, I saw you walk out from the bathrooms on camera. I saw you not pay, and I saw you walk over here. You need to give me these back, or I will call the police. Call the police then. I then went to the front of the car and took a picture of the driver and said, Just so you know, what your ride is taking is over the amount needed to be considered a felony. So if you don't want to be involved, I deny this ride. Driver. I'm not her ride. I'm her friend. Me. Well, as a friend, I would tell her to stop or else you'll be involved with a felony. I went back and took pictures of the license plate and pictures of the lady loading things into the car. Me. Just so you know, if you take these items, you and your friend will be convicted of a felony charge. Thief. Well then, fine, take your food back, but keep it in the cart because I'm coming back with my receipt and you'll be sorry. You'll be fired. Your whole store will go down. Me. If you come back with a receipt, I'll gladly quit my job. Just do the right thing. She ended up giving back all the groceries and leaving. Surprise, she never came back. Stupid people. All I deal with are stupid people. Do this next.
Tap here on your screen to come see our new podcast playlist, where you'll find thousands of hours of the best stories you've ever heard. Or tap the one on the right. That episode is specifically just for you, based on other videos you've enjoyed the most.